good to see everyone. It's hard to believe that it is already September. Um, the summer's summer's flown by, despite uh, the circumstances that we were all living under. Um, so why don't we, before we begin, I'll turn it over to Steve to do roll call. Great. Good morning, um, Ms. Bradford. Here. Uh, Ms. Hendricks. Here. Uh, Mr. Keeley. Here. Uh, Mr. Prasad. Here. And Ms. Erden. Here. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, Ms. Yamamoto. Here. Uh, for the Director of Finance, Ms. Miller. Here. Uh, Treasurer Ma. Here. Uh, for the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, uh, Mr. Yamanaka. Here. Uh, and Controller E. Here. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Great. Thank you. All right, thank you um, everyone. Again, good to see you all. Um, I would like to just um, uh, welcome and recognize um, our newest board member, Jennifer Erden, who's joining us today. So um, welcome, Jennifer. We are thrilled to have you um, and look forward to the contributions we know you're gonna make um, to this committee and to the board. So really look forward to continuing to work with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it's completely mutual. Thank you. Um, so just in terms of some, some procedural notes, um, the board will have a 10 minute public comment period at the end of each agenda item. Uh, the public comment after each item will be limited to that agenda item topic. And then there also will be an additional opportunity for statements for the public um, for items not pertaining to a specific agenda item, which we'll do um, shortly at the start of our meeting. Um, individuals who wish to speak at the board um, conference should dial into our public comment line which is toll-free number 833-986-0555 and wait in the call-in queue. Uh, each speaker will be allowed a maximum of three minutes for your presentation. And if there's not enough uh, time um, uh, for the time allocated for everyone to have three minutes, the timing will be um, modified depending on the time that's available. Uh, the Teachers Retirement Board meetings are live web streamed and video archived which are available to the public on calsters.com. Um, in order to protect the privacy of minors who wish to address the board, um, we do um, ask that public commenters who are under the age of 18 only state their name and affiliation, um, but don't share any personal identifying information like a last name or, or age or school. Um, so the first, the first item that we have before we move to um, the opportunity for public comment is just approval of the committee agenda. Can I have a motion to approve? I move approval, Madam Chair. Second. Great, so it's moved by Gail, a second that I think by Sharon. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Great, um, any opposed or abstaining? No, okay. Okay, well now we're gonna turn it over to, um, to statements um, from the public. I just wanna um, provide the board as well as any anyone watching the meeting um, with some background on the public comments. Um, this item is scheduled for 30 minutes and we'll split the time between the callers. Uh, comments made during this time period may pertain to topics that are, are or, or are not covered by a specific agenda item. Um, as a reminder, we accept public comments in two forms, um, both verbally at meetings like this one and in writing. Um, before we take verbal comments, I just wanna summarize for the board um, the written communications that we've received since our July board meeting. Um, that we have um, received um, form letters resulting from some form letter campaigns. We've received a total of 85 emails calling for divestment from fossil fuels, 69 emails calling for divestment from SeaWorld, two emails calling for divestment from General Dynamics, um, and then we also continue to receive um, emails um, on other topics, including two emails about our investments in China and Chinese-owned companies. Um, so that's just a little bit of background in terms of what we received um, in writing. And I think that information um, has been made available to, um, to the board, uh, but we just wanted to remind you of that. Um, so now I think I'm gonna turn it over to Samantha. Um, we'll be taking um, the public comments um, uh, for this, uh, for this um, portion of the meeting. Okay, um, our first comment is from Iman. Iman, go ahead. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so hello, my name is Iman and I am here again 
to tell you the effects of you spending billions in the fossil fuel industry. If we keep burning fossil fuels at our current rate, we will lose all our fossil fuels by 2060. Now, I'm going to quote a sentence from your website. It says, divestment is a last resort action that can have a lasting negative impact on the health of the teacher's retirement fund, while also severely limiting our ability to shape corporate behavior for long-term sustainable growth. That is what your website says. Now, let me ask you, how could divesting from fossil fuels have a lasting negative impact on the health of the teacher's retirement fund when the fossil fuel industry is losing revenue? Chevron has already reported a loss of $8.3 billion in 2020, while Shell Oil reported losing $18 billion. And if I may add, how do you plan on shaping corporate behavior for long-term sustainable growth when it is their job to create greenhouse gases? We have been coming to these meetings for years, and it seems that we have made no progress whatsoever moving towards clean energy and divesting. Then last month, Diane from Calcer sent a letter to our adult coordinator saying you have decided that divestment will not be in on any future agendas. And let me be clear, we do not need to lower carbon emissions. We need to stop our emissions if we want to have a planet to live in. So let me ask you what we can do to help you make this decision faster, hopefully in your lifetime. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller um, will be Magdalena. Magdalena, go ahead. Hi, it's me, Magdalena, with the Earth Guardians Bay Area crew. I use she, her pronouns. I'm 12 now. I first started coming to your meetings when I was 10. I am honestly confused. Why do you keep saying engagement with the fossil fuel industry is a solution while we only have a couple of years left? It does not make money for the teachers, and you are not on the right side of history. My brother Amin told you in the last meeting that 92% of people living next to fossil fuel sites in California are black, indigenous, and people of color. We saw on your social media that you posted about Black Lives Matter and how teachers can fight racism. Ms. Hendricks, it is extra hard to see you share you did a run for Maud and went to a ceremony for George Floyd. It's hard to see you do that because you are in a position that very few people in our world are in, where you can divest from what is hurting so many black families. Did you know that Black Lives Matter has on their list of demands to divest from fossil fuels? Does it feel weird for you to say you support Black Lives Matter when you're choosing to do the opposite of what the movement calls for? Also, why did you say divestment won't be on any future agendas? That's a really big statement. Ms. Hendricks, in a meeting we had together, you said you live in LA and that CalSTRS needs to keep investing in fossil fuels because people won't stop driving. You seemed 100% sure that would never happen. But in the beginning of this pandemic, I forgot what traffic was we actually saw empty freeways. We are exhausted in this pandemic. As a student, school and life are already exhausting. Like all the other kids, I am at school on a computer. Zoom blank blocks filling what should be desk area with engaged students. My teachers are working so, so, so hard and doing their very best. The worst part is that this pandemic the violence and horrible things we are living through right now, horrible problems we are living through right now, are only just a teeny fraction of what will happen with the climate crisis. This is the most important fact. The fossil fuel companies are not the seconds. used ally. Please email us the answers to our questions. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller will be Isha. Isha, go ahead. My name is Isha Clark. I am 17. I am born, raised, and educated in Oakland, California, and I am an activist with Youth Versus Apocalypse. 
I have a message for CalSTRS Board Vice Chair Sharon Hendricks. In this moment of uprisings against anti-blackness, you dare to claim that Black Lives Matter to you while you invest over $6 billion in companies that are taking years off of our lives. Almost every place that extracts, processes, or transports fossil fuels are located in communities that are predominantly black and brown and working class. My people, my community, you dare to say that black lives matter to you while you are actively taking years off of our lives. Joy Higa, you are the new investment chair for CalSTRS. We, the young people, are counting on you to take this in a different direction. Okay, thank you for your comment. Our next caller will be Raina. Raina, go ahead. Good morning. My name is Rena Myers Dockamp, and I've been the liaison between CalSTRS and the youth groups for the past year and a half. I've seen the relationship become adversarial. A few of you have told me that you think they are not respectful, that they should lead with more curiosity, and that you, they do not understand the complexities of engagement and divestment. I cannot disagree more with these statements. Getting to be in close relationship with these young people has been one of the most humbling, insightful, and most sacred experiences of my life. White body supremacy culture has poisoned every single one of us and every system that we touch. With great sophistication, this culture has made it acceptable to deem some people as experts worthy of time to make a presentation before the CalSTRS board and others, like those living on the front lines of the impacts of your fossil fuel investments, as not worthy. It has made it possible for you to dismiss everyone calling for divestment as environmentalists, instead of choosing to rightfully identify us in your reports as active and retired teachers, students, indigenous leaders, parents, pediatricians, and scientists. White body supremacy culture makes everything feel so busy that it can be challenging to actually pause from the agenda to really listen and reflect. The teacher's pension fund should not be an opponent of the youth-led movement for climate justice. At this time in history especially, the teacher's fund should proudly choose to follow the movement for black lives demand for divestment from fossil fuels. I'd like to hold a moment of silence so that we can make space for each of you to further absorb what Iman, Magdalena, and Isha just shared. Please join me in just taking a breath. Welcome their words to help you step into the very best version of yourself as individuals and as a collective. 30 seconds. Board. Welcome their clarity and questions as the needed medicine for these times. Okay, thank you for your call. Our next caller will be Joan. Go ahead, Joan. Good morning, and thank you, Rena, for that moment of silence. I really appreciate it. Appreciate the voices of the youth. Uh, my name is Joan Lohman. I'm the wife of a CalSTRS beneficiary who's a retired community college teacher, and we're grateful for a CalSTRS pension. On Sunday, August 16th, I was shocked to hear that Death Valley, California, experienced the hottest temperatures ever recorded reliably on our Earth. Meanwhile, the Arctic, where I've spent a number of weeks, is warming twice as fast as any other region. 
Permafrost is thawing at an unprecedented rate. When permafrost thaws, as we know, carbon dioxide and methane are released. The current temperatures of the permafrost worldwide is the highest ever recorded. I was unaware until recently that the world's permafrost holds 1,500 billion tons of carbon. 1,500 billion tons of carbon, double the amount currently in our atmosphere. And for every Celsius degree of temperature increase, 1.5 million square miles of permafrost is lost through thawing. Here in California, our forests and our homes are on fire. According to the Union of Concerned Scientists, the heating up of our planet, the dryness caused by drought, the earlier snow melt and higher temperatures are all contributing to the length and intensity of our fire seasons. According to these same scientists, quote, we must reduce our reliance on fossil fuels to limit the risk of worsening fires. The melting of ice and permafrost the intensity and number of wildfires. There are so many climate-related reasons to consider divesting from fossil fuels. You know, for six years, Fossil Free California has been pleading with you, the investment committee, please put divestment from fossil fuel on your agenda, please. We come before you again and again. Do you hear the voices of these young ones who just spoke and the many others? Do you hear the voices of elders such as myself? I'm 76. What is preventing you from having an in-depth and open conversation about divestment from fossil fuels? California teachers and students want to know what catastrophe will finally open your eyes to the tragic folly of staying invested in fossil fuels. Thank you. Thank you for listening, and Joy, please listen to our thoughts. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller will be Lynn. Lynn, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. I'm a CalSTRS retiree, and I appreciate the pension that I receive. On September 15, 2019, the San Francisco Chronicle announced it was joining more than 200 news outlets around the world in examining the impacts of global climate change. They plan to explore the dangers as well as policy issues that could limit the looming disasters. That was one year ago in response to the 4 million who joined the World Climate Marches, led by Greta Thunberg and other youth leaders. During this current round of intense heat and fires, the Chronicle committed to even more coverage of climate change. Their terrifying photographs of the flame show why. What kinds of disasters will it take to awaken you, the board of the Calister's Financial Investment Committee, to the danger of climate change that is fed partly by Calister's investment in fossil fuel? In truth, you are using teacher and district contributions to fund climate change. How do you sleep at night? I live in Davis, 20 miles from the Vacaville fire. Many of the small farms that supply produce to the Bay Area, to Yolo County and Sacramento now face damaged or destroyed infrastructure and crops. A beekeeper raised much-needed pollinator queen bees until the fire destroyed her hives. For two full weeks, I've had to wear an N95 mask just to step outside because the air is still toxic, even with the fires now 69% contained. The livelihood for farmers who struggle in the best of times is threatened, and the food supply for a whole region is diminished. There were five deaths. Are these losses sufficient to get your attention? This is why we urge you to divest from fossil fuel investments. You are funding climate disasters like the nightmare we are living right now in California. Our health and food supply are at stake. People's livelihoods and lives are at stake. Divest now 
to end this devastating cycle. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller will be Miriam. Miriam, go ahead. Pastors, my name is Miriam. I'm a recent college graduate and I experience climate anxiety on a daily basis. The recent fires have only confirmed that my anxiety has basis. I feel it only more strongly. And yet recently I learned that your climate goals are based off of four degrees Celsius of global temperature rise. That is far more, over double the temperature rise recommended by the IPCC, which is 1.5 degrees. Where did that goal come from? I would love to know. And from my calculations, that means that over 30 feet of sea level rise will be ap apparent in the Bay Area where I live. That would put my house, my city, and the Bay Area underwater permanently. That is thousands of your constituents, of your pension holders. Do you care? Not only that, but fires will rack the state and the country. You can respond and contribute to a solution through divestment. It's a piece of the solution because you stop supporting fossil fuels. I understand that many of my fellow callers have called for years calling for divestment. I thank you for creating a space for public comment, but I have a request. They have heard no response. Will you please consider releasing a statement, speaking with us, or addressing in your meeting why divestment is not a financially and environmentally beneficial solution? My understanding is that divestment will increase your return on investment by billions of dollars. It will stand behind the futures of all of us. What are you thinking? Because I really want to understand. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller is Marianne. Marianne, go ahead. Marianne? Yes. I'm an adjunct faculty member in the Para Alto Community College District for over 20 years. I've been concerned about the use of fossil fuels and climate change since my university days and had hoped for much faster progress on this issue, especially from the faculty pension program that I contribute to. I have understood for years that fossil fuels will at some point become a stranded asset. And earlier this year, the statement, and earlier this year, I read a statement from BlackRock on their understanding of the potential climate impact of their risk portfolio and returns. If they are turning towards sustainability in their portfolios and away from fossil fuels, that mo movement is not starting. CalSTRS has a lost a large percentage of its returns this year by dragging their feet on this issue. It is long since time to move away from fossil fuel investments. Engagement with the industry has not worked, and divestment is the right thing for our children and, and grandchildren's future. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller is Suzanne. Suzanne, go ahead. Hi, and thank you so much for opening up this space um, to talk about these issues that influence um, and affect us um, as CalSTRS retirees and those involved in education. So my name is Suzanne Hume, and I'm a member of CalSTRS and the founder of CleanEarthForKids.org. CalSTRS must divest from fossil fuels now. Fossil fuels are poisoning our air and our water. We must protect the air our children breathe. This is a social, racial, climate, and environmental justice issue. To continue to be invested in fossil fuels is absolutely counterproductive to our mission and goals as teachers and educators. Being invested in fossil fuels is absolutely immoral, absolutely unjust, and it's just plain wrong. We must divest and divest now. Breathing dangerous, dirty air triggers asthma. Asthma is the number one reason that children miss school in the United States and the third leading reason why children are hospitalized. Also, drilling and fracking for oil poisons our water. 
for a livable future, Calsters must divest now. As teachers and educators, we give 100% to making sure our students, our students are safe when they are in our classrooms. And we do everything to make sure they have a fantastic school experience. But then they are to go home and in the communities where they live, breathe this toxic poisonous air and drink this water that's been tainted by fossil fuels that we are invested in. It is absolutely hypocritical and absolutely upsetting. Also, fossil fuels are a bad investment. So please divest now. Thank you very much. Thank you for your call. Our next caller is Carlos. Carlos, go ahead. Yes, I'm reading a statement for Laura Dill. I am a public educator who has been signing petitions and waiting and watching for years now. The CalSTRS teacher retirement system to divest from fossil fuels here in California. It is obscene that in a green energy forward democratically led state like California, we cannot see the biggest teachers pension fund divest once and for all from fossil fuels. We need to set an example now. Join 2020 and divest CalSTRS from the hands of outdated fossil fuels. Go green technology energy. Be a leader. It is beyond time to go green. Thank you. And I'm reading another statement from Paula Waxman. Dear CalSTRS, thank you for all that you do on our behalf. However, I would like to strongly recommend that when it is fiscally responsible to do so, as we pull out of the pandemic, that you completely divest yourself from fossil fuel stocks. That you have not already divested from coal is a mystery. There are many fiscally responsible investments that you can make in environmentally clean technologies and businesses with good corporate governance. For example, companies with sensible top and middle management pay ratios without sacrificing investment returns or diversification. For example, precision agriculture, traffic systems management technology, alternative water resource technology, plant-based meat substitutes, and so on. Our investments should not only take into consideration returns, but also reflect our values in terms of the environment, social equity, social justice, and governance. You have done a good job for us, but we can do better. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller is Elizabeth. Elizabeth, go ahead. Hi, yes, um, I am a speech language pathologist with a Los Angeles Unified School District. And I am asking the board to consider um, divestment. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like what we're teaching the students to live in a future that is, you know, good for everyone. And right now it seems like with our money pulled into fossil fuels, it's like we're contributing to a future that is not sustainable for for the students for the future future generation so i'm asking that you know um the board consider divestment thank you thank you for your comment that will conclude our item two comments Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Samantha. Um, I just want to um, make a couple of comments. I just want to thank um, those members of the public, um, you know, whether they were t teachers or students or others who um, came to our meeting to provide some public comments. Um, I know that many of you have been engaging with uh, members of our staff, and we just ask the staff to continue to, um, you know, to continue those communications. Um, I think there were a couple of statements that were made by some of the callers that may not have. Um, completely accurately um, described um, some of the engagement and communication that we have. So we'll we'll ask the staff to do some follow up um, uh, just to address some of those issues. Um, and then the other other comment that I'd like to make is just to um, you know reiterate or or make sure that members of the public, anyone watching, knows that um, you know everyone uh, who serves on the Calsters board, whether you're the chair or the vice chair 
or any other member of the board take very seriously the comments that we, we hear from um, our members um, and from other public stakeholders. Um, we take that into consideration and we ask our staff to follow up appropriately. Um, so I just, I wanted to, to underscore that. Um, and also just, I, I cannot help but say that um, my friend and colleague, uh, Sharon Hendricks, whose name came up a little bit during the comments today, is someone that I've had the honor of knowing for um, the years that I've served on this board. Um, she is incredibly committed to everything that we are doing for the teachers of California. She represents us with distinction um, on the board of an international organization called PRI Global, which is focused on climate change and sustainability. Um, and I know that she, um, she thinks about uh, these issues a lot um, and very carefully. And I just want to thank Sharon for everything she does um, for our board along with um, my other colleagues. Thank you. Okay, well, let's move on um, to the other parts of the agenda. Um, the next two items, agenda items three and four, um, are consent items um, for, um, for action. I just want to note a couple of things that um, the item number three, which is on the consent agenda, is um, our minutes from our investment committee open session um, and some um, uh, errors were identified, and I believe that everyone should have received a copy of the corrected minutes. Um, and then item number four um, is a change to our special mandates policy um, regarding our low carbon mandate. And I just wanted to note, um, note for the record that there is a letter from our consultants, Makita, on INV24 that concurs with the staff recommendation to make that policy change. Um, so if there are not any questions or any need to pull the items, I would um, take a motion for approval of, of both consent items. Mm -hmm. I move so moved. Karen, Karen moves approval, and then um, Bill second. Um, is second. Thank you, Bill. Um, Steve, do we need to do a roll call? Do we need to do a roll call? Bill? Sorry, Madam Chair, uh, we, we can. It's it's at your pleasure. It's a consent action, but we, we can do one. Um, I, I think since this is a, a consent item, maybe we will we'll just. Okay. I'll. Uh, just, uh, just say that with, you know, with no objections, this item's approved. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So now we're moving on to agenda item number five. Um, so we've got three items under agenda item number five, items A, B, and C. Um, this is the, um, the, one of the two times a year that we have a chance to hear from our consultants for um, a semi-annual report um, on the fund's performance. Um, I just wanted to, um, you know, re remind um, some of our, remind the board about um, what we have a chance to take a look at. Typically, um, in open session, we'll hear from our consultants um, and have a chance to interact, interact with them and ask questions um, looking at our different asset classes. Um, and then we'll also have some time set aside in closed session to dig deeper um, with our consultants and our staff um, on the semi-annual reports, um, including being able in, in closed session to um, discuss specific um, managers if there are questions about that. Um, so I think um, with that, I will um, turn it over. I think am I turning it over to Chris? You know, kick off, or maybe I'll just turn it directly over to Steve and Alan. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Roy. Uh, Steve okay. McCourt uh, at Makita, and. Uh, Alan and I will be uh, will be tag teaming uh, this report. Uh, I'll be providing a um, review of the the capital markets over the last 12 months through June 30th, uh, and uh, review the performance of Calsters over that time period as well, uh, and then hand it off to Alan, who will be discussing some dynamics in the um, in these crazy markets that uh, that we're living through. Uh, and then we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions from the committee as well. Uh, the, the first thing I want to highlight is um, what a uh, absurd year in the markets uh, um, that uh, that we all lived through. Um, certainly a tale of two or three different environments uh, in the market from the beginning of the fiscal year uh, in July 2019 through mid-February. Uh, there was a continuation of a uh, uh, 10 year plus bull market uh, in the US and outside the US as well. Um, when uh, the market began to recognize the real risks associated with uh, the coronavirus pandemic, 
uh, and uh, economies uh, were shut down as a consequence. Uh, the, the capital markets experienced the deepest, sharpest uh, bear market in its history from February 19th through uh, late March. Um, and then somehow on the uh, on the backs of um, what can only be described as historic levels of central bank and fiscal support for the global economy, um, ex experienced a um, uh, incredible rebound over the last uh, three months of the fiscal year. So all in all, I th I th the U.S. equity market for the 12 months ending June 30th uh, was up 7%, uh, not too distant at all from what its long-term expected return uh, might be. Uh, international stocks uh, fared a bit worse for the year, uh, down 5% um, as they didn't fully participate in the recovery post-March. Uh, uh, fixed income assets, core fixed income assets were up 8% uh, for the year. Um, uh, private equity as an asset class was roughly flat and real estate as an asset class was up roughly 4%. So if you were to simply look at the returns of the capital markets, um, you would categorize the year as a um, uh, slightly below average year for the capital markets. Uh, but of course, there was a lot of uh, interesting twists and turns uh, along the way. Um, I won't spend too much time uh, uh, discussing the, the rationale for uh, market movements during the year, but the two most significant uh, supports for the markets that have arguably allowed the markets to rebound as strongly as they have since late March uh, have been, number one, the level of interest rates uh, in the economy, uh, long-term interest rates from June 30th, 2019 through June 30th, uh, 2020, declined from roughly 2% to about 0.6%. Uh, when bonds are yielding close to zero, even going out 10 years on the yield curve, uh, it gives equity investors a lot of excuses to uh, to purchase equities uh, irrespective of price. Uh, and that's certainly been one of the drivers of uh, the rebound in the markets. Uh, the second one worth highlighting is the uh, degree of uh, monetary and fiscal support. Uh, and certainly some of that created the low interest rate environment that we're living in. Uh, uh, but the, um, the the scale and scope so far, uh, at least uh, on both monetary and fiscal support for the economy, uh, has been um, significantly beyond uh, the level of support that's typically provided in uh, in normal uh, recessions. Um, moving on to uh, Calster's performance specifically, and and the the best summary. Um, slide on this in your in your packet is uh, INV29. Um, uh, during this year, uh, CalSTRS produced a return of 3.9%. Um, so below the assumed rate of return uh, for the fund, um, but uh, quite strong relative to benchmarks and peers for the year. Uh, the uh, portfolio outperformed its policy benchmark by 20 basis points for the trailing 12 months um, and outperformed peers by a uh, very strong 1.8% for the, the trailing uh, 12 months. Uh, six out of the nine asset classes outperformed their benchmarks uh, for the year. So broadly speaking, very strong uh, execution and outcomes on a relative basis for uh, the overall plan. Uh, what I wanted to highlight as well is that uh, longer term performance is uh, is equally impressive. Uh, the plan has now outperformed um, its peer index of public pension plans over $10 billion uh, in every one of the last eight years, um, which is uh, a really, really challenging um, uh, 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 result to uh, to beat. Uh, it's outperformed uh, its policy benchmark in five of the last uh, eight years. And over the prior decade, uh, it's outperformed uh, its peer group by 80 basis points per year on average. Uh, and if you were to compound those 80 basis points on an asset base uh, that CalSTRS had 10 years ago, uh, that 80 basis points of incremental return results in about $25 billion of added value to the plan. So, um, 
uh, over long periods of time, these levels of outperformance can, can add really, really good value to the plan. Uh, the one asset class that I would uh, highlight uh, had a, um, a weak relative year uh, is the RMS uh, asset class. Uh, and I think the most important thing to note here is that uh, on an absolute basis, uh, and given the the role of the risk mitigating strategies as uh, strategies designed to protect uh, the fund in a significant downturn um, in the economy and the markets, um, they performed extraordinarily well. So during the point in the year where you needed them to produce uh, good returns, uh, which was uh, February and March, uh, uh, on the whole, they produced very strong returns for you, offsetting a lot of the volatility in your equities in the portfolio. Uh, the and the absolute performance for the year uh, of being up roughly eight percent is obviously a strong result for a category which has a long-term expected return several several percentage points below that. Uh, but the return uh, was uh, a few percentage points below the policy benchmark index uh, that was caused uh, largely by. Uh, challenges with uh, several of the active managers within the global macro trend following and risk premia subcategories within RMS. Uh, and I would just note that staff is aware of um, those short-term challenges, uh, is regularly reviewing uh, managers and strategies in that context. And uh, as you know, is also reviewing the, the broader um, uh, uh, policy allocation within uh, within um, the RMS asset class. Uh, and then finally, uh, as I hand it over to Alan, I just want to, uh, without going through them specifically, just highlight for you uh, the uh, the slides on INV 37 through 41. Um, you can skim through them um, at your leisure, but these are slides that show us the relative valuations of different parts of the capital markets, in particular, uh, what I want to highlight here is that the the level of um, internal imbalances in the markets today between different types of stocks and different types of sectors, including small and large cap stocks, U.S. and international stocks, value and growth stocks, um, are as wide as we've seen them since the late 1990s. And generally speaking, when when uh, when the market uh, uh, goes up uh, in a fashion that disproportionately affects a few number of stocks or a few sectors, um, it is often a sign that, uh, that the, uh, the rise in the market is, is not fully sustainable. So uh, just something to bear in mind that the, uh, the, the, the rising tide of these markets have not lifted all market boats and some of the valuations uh, in you, you see in our slides um, uh, remind us of some of the, the valuation discrepancies we saw in the late 1990s uh, before that market uh, came to a screeching halt. And I'm going to hand it over to um, to Alan now to talk about some of the other kind of forward-looking dynamics to be uh, aware of. Thanks, Steve. I just want to make sure I'm coming through. Yes, great. Thank you. Uh, start off with, uh, it's really nice to see everyone uh, even though it's uh, via Zoom, it seems our whole life has become centered around looking at computer screens as opposed to looking at people in person. Uh, it's a challenge unto itself, and I really hope that you and everyone listening uh, continues to be healthy and in good spirits. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is to try to remember where you were in 1982. Uh, it's an awfully long time ago, and people on the phone, probably the students, uh, some of their parents might not have even been born in 1982, but it's important to look back so that we can look at history as a basis to help us look at the future. And there are four challenges that I think all institutional investors have to address, I will address two of them. The two I won't address are COVID, because number one, I'm not medically qualified to have an opinion about COVID. And number two, there's no textbook or there's no finance tome that can give me any insight on how to deal with a pandemic which is not being well managed. Uh, the other one 
is politics. And both domestic politics and international politics are at best problematic. And it is much better for me to defer to experts of which you have two sitting on your board uh, about a topic that uh, I'm probably uh, not the best person to address. So I will address two areas that I do have some comfort talking about. And effectively, these two areas represent two different trends. From 1982, that point in history that I ask you to look at, until quite recently, the capital markets had a tailwind. There was lots of really good news for a very long period of time, and the capital markets had extraordinary performance. And now we look at 2020, approaching 2021, and those tailwinds are behind us. And we're now looking, in our opinion, at headwinds. And that's what I'm going to try to very briefly talk about and not really refer to the book. First, interest rates. Uh, I hope you're sitting down because in 1982, January 1st, the yield on the 10-year Treasury bond was 14.6%. That's not an exaggeration. That's not a missed decimal point. 14.6%. So if 39 years ago you could have bought a 40-year bond, it would have grown at a rate of 14.6% a year with a dividend, an interest rate, every year for the last 40 years. Today, that 10-year Treasury bond, which was yielding 14.6%, is yielding 66 basis points, 0.66% of 1%. So literally, it's 14% lower today than it was in 1982. And what happened over the 40-year period was interest rates fell consistently, throwing off enormous interest payments, and unbelievably high capital gains. And the great returns, very long term, that the system and other investors experienced was driven in no small part by that constantly falling interest rates. Well, let's now compare the equity market. Same time, 1982, January 1st, the Schiller PE was at 7.7, .7, making it very, in quote, cheap. Today, that same price earnings ratio, that measure is 30. So it's certainly four times more expensive to buy a dollar of earnings. Uh, it's hard to see phenomenally high future rates of return from equities when your starting point is that high of a multiple. So when you combine low interest rates with high PEs, together that creates a significant headwind to generating the kind of returns that you need to better fund the system. Lastly, in points of comparison, uh, Many of you probably have money market accounts or cash accounts. Today, the yield on the short-term treasury note is 10 basis points, one-tenth of 1%. 1 in 1982, the yield on that, for those of you who remember, was the beginning of the Merrill Lynch money market account. The yield was 14%. Once again, I'm not missing a decimal point. 14% for holding cash. Now you have to put that in perspective. There had been three previous years of high inflation and those rates reflected the fact that there was a perception that inflation would go on indefinitely. That did not occur and that generated the outstanding returns for both stocks and bonds. The pressures on stocks and bonds, particularly bonds, those pressures will impact all investments. It, don't, it is not limited to bonds. 
In, there will be repression and returns in every asset class to various degrees. You and your staff and other investors, you cannot control what happens in the capital markets. Uh, you have to respond to it. You have a long-term plan, you have a disciplined plan. It's designed to do well over the long term. In the short term, there can be significant volatility, losses and gains. So the capital market, you just have to accept. But what you can do and what your staff does, there are two things that you can have a lot of influence over, costs and risk. In terms of cost, you and your staff have developed and are implementing the collaborative model, which is going to be discussed later, but is designed to influence one of the things you have some control over, which is costs. And the board and the staff have also adopted a risk budgeting process and tool to manage risk in the portfolio. That's something else that you and your staff have control over. It's important to keep in mind what you can and what you cannot influence. And where you can influence things, particularly costs and risk management, that's where the focus should be, recognizing that as a long-term investor, there's very little you can do other than at the margins to change what the capital markets gives you. I'm happy to answer any questions and Steve continues to be on the line and he'll be happy to answer questions also. Um, thanks, Alan, and thanks, Steve. I um, are there. We can pause for a moment now if there are um, questions that the board members have. Um, so we do have some. Oh. Betty, did you? I, I saw your hand and then it disappeared. Did you have? Yeah, a, I did. Okay. Okay, yeah, go ahead. We'll turn it over to the controller. Thank you. Sorry, my um, Zoom was kind of flashing. So thank you. Um, thank you, Joy. And um, thank you, Ellen and Steve, for the presentation. Um, I guess um, there isn't a lot of, um, I guess, difference in terms of uh, how things are being uh, viewed politically versus how we're having to look at the situation confronting um, Calster. So I'm not going to go into politics except to say that I, I'm actually really heartened by the increased coverage about the, um, I guess, uh, the um, uh, divergence between uh, what we're seeing happening on Wall Street versus the economy in general. So I think, um, you know, I, there's getting to be a more uh, greater public understanding about, uh, you know, that aspect of what's happening. So I'm, I'm actually pleased about a little bit more uh, public uh, attention to that. Um, I had a couple thoughts and um, just questions and really more your observations about, um, you know, just some of the things that we were able to put in place since 2008. And um, obviously, uh, feel good that we were able to uh, really put the uh, RMS strategy in place. And uh, I guess just beginning there uh, in terms of uh, RMS uh, helping to um, blunt some of the volatility. Uh, from your perspective, is there more that we can do to maximize, uh, I guess, that strategy uh, going forward? Yeah, this is uh, Steve McCourt. Maybe I'll. I'll I'll take that uh, first. Um, uh, I think uh, your uh, committee has been um, uh, following, you know, really strong best practices with respect to addressing uh, asset allocation, uh, strategic asset allocation, fairly regularly. Uh, the the trend, uh, I think, for good reason, uh, over the last decade has been to um, uh, reduce reliance on uh, equity markets and uh, limit risk in the portfolio. Uh, and obviously the, the movement of the assumed rate of return uh, down to 7% sort of uh, reflected that as well. Um, uh, RMS was uh, one of the more recent uh, um, ideas uh, that uh, that staff had to, at the margin, mitigate risk in the, uh, the portfolio. 
uh, and uh, sort of a, a good example of um, uh, timing being always difficult in the markets. Uh, you had it up and running for several years before uh, there was a bear market to test it. And uh, credit to this board and to to staff as well for having the patience to stick with a long-term strategic asset allocation that included a meaningful allocation to risk mitigating strategies. Uh, when the when the bear market hit um, with force in late February and early March, uh, that part of the portfolio was the best performing part, um, producing a very positive return, um, largely because of the long-term treasury bonds uh, that comprise a big a big part of that. Um, so it. Uh, it proved its worth um, quite well, uh, and um, staff uh, continually reviews the the composition of managers. Uh, staff is currently reviewing the uh, allocations of the various sectors within RMS, uh, which uh, are long term treasuries, um, uh, global macro strategies, trend following strategies, and and risk premia to to um, uh, optimize that mix uh, based on the current market environment. Uh, and uh, arguably the biggest change recently has been the lower long-term interest rates, which make those long-term treasuries uh, yield even less today than they did uh, a year ago. So uh, we can certainly report that your staff is uh, putting significant thought um, to that. Uh, and uh, as a committee, uh, we would certainly encourage you to continue to um, uh, look at RMS uh, within that lens of being a risk mitigating uh, part of your overall portfolio. Uh, and I think as we uh, move on in time and do um, more asset allocation modeling in the future, uh, I'd be surprised if it doesn't continue to, to represent a, a best practice in how public pension plans design asset allocation and um, and manage risk in this environment. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Steve. I appreciate the response to that. Um, and then I uh, think also, as was observed um, previously when we've had um, discussions about um, just the role of the Fed uh, this time around and certainly um, acting more quickly, possibly informed by its experience um, during the last, uh, during the Great Recession. Um, what, are there any, um, I guess, monetary policies that stand out in terms of having the greatest impact on the economy from your perspective? I, uh, you know, it's it, it's the, the, there's a bunch. Um, I the the um, it'll be very interesting to 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 see them all evolve because in the reality, but much like the pandemic, we're still early on in the recession. We're early on in uh, kind of judging uh, all of these policies. Uh, and and I, I, I'd want to note that um, the most powerful tool that the central bank has um, is their mouth. Uh, the communication of policy is a far more impactful tool than the policy itself. So arguably, um, the, the, the most important uh, uh, thing that the Fed did to uh, create confidence in the capital markets was to tell the capital markets that in late March that it was prepared to do more or less whatever it takes to support uh, asset prices that are being um, hit by the pandemic. And the, 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 the truly unprecedented policy uh, reactions to that included um, the ability to purchase uh, investment grade bonds onto the Fed's balance sheet um, and below investment grade bonds, if those companies were rated rated investment grade below the, before the pandemic and ETFs, which held high yield bonds. And so, so the, the market's interpretation of that very, very broad policy of supporting the, the corporate bond markets um, was rightly or wrongly that the Fed was there to support uh, corporate uh, credit risk, um, and if the if the risk of bankruptcies uh, and defaults are off the table in the near term, um, that provides equity investors a lot of comfort in providing risk capital to equities. So, so that that was um, clearly one of the more significant ones, and uh, one I'd note as well, uh, uh, Controller Yi, is uh, just in the last 
week, uh, the Fed confirming its interpretation of its inflation mandate, uh, which is really a sea change for the Federal Reserve. For for um, eons, the Federal Reserve has operated with a implicit or explicit two to two and a half percent inflation target um, that it uses to help guide uh, its uh, policies on interest rates. Uh, and the way every former Federal Reserve board viewed that target was it was a point in time target, meaning uh, the moment the economy accelerated uh, and experienced inflation of 2%, uh, that gave the Federal Reserve the green light to raise interest rates and begin slowing the economy um, so that we wouldn't have a repeat of the of the 1970s. That was the, the general narrative. Um, based on a lot of staff work at the Federal Reserve over the last decade. Um, their, uh, the, the, the Federal Reserve uh, recently formally um, uh, adopted approach that was uh, called an average inflation approach, which essentially means it's not good enough that you get inflation back to two and two and a half percent. You have to make up for all the undershooting of inflation in the economy over the previous five to 10 years. So what that means is that when inflation does go back up to 2.5%, the Federal Reserve will not raise interest rates. It will continue to keep interest rates low and will allow inflation to run above that target so that over long periods of time, the, infl- the economy can average inflation of 2 to 2.5%, not just have that 2 to 2.5% as a ceiling on the economy. Um, so this, this I'm sure sounds like, like nuance and technical detail, but it actually makes a really big difference on how people view uh, future interest rates. It's a big reason why 10-year treasury bonds are yielding uh, less than 70 basis points today. And um, uh, it, w- one of many, many communications the Fed has made over the last six months that has given the markets confidence that the Federal Reserve will continue to provide uh, maximum monetary support for, for the economy. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then I um, just wanted to just check in on sufficiency of liquidity. Any concerns around that? Uh, no concerns from our uh, perspective. There were no liquidity uh, uh, issues around the very chaotic market environment in uh, in March, which I think is a great testament for your approach to liquidity. Um, uh, but if uh, if they're interested, it might be useful to have uh, Chris or Scott um, respond to that question as well. I'd be happy to. Chris Elman, Chief Investment Officer. Uh, we have adequate liquidity uh, going out, Betty. Uh, we forecasted out uh, seven months at a time. Obviously, we have a huge amount of capital we've committed to private equity that has not been drawn. So as you get farther out, on private investments, it's harder to forecast how that would go. But we watch our liquidity very closely. We actually also have a liquidity team that is uh, putting together a plan to be able to create cash very quickly in the public asset classes of fixed income and and equity. Um, So a number of tools at our disposal, uh, and we're at 2.7% right now and just free cash. So a very high cash position. Great. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. And then, um, I'm sorry, I have to ask this crystal ball question. Uh, so with most of the um, asset classes uh, highly, so highly valued, um, any sense of um, when there will be opportunities to purchase quality investments at attractive prices? Uh, Betty, this, this is Alan. Yeah. Um, if I had the answer to that question, as much as I enjoy being on Zoom calls, I probably wouldn't be doing a Zoom call. That's what uh, I, I know. Uh, it's really so challenging uh, yeah. to try to make a call on when things will change. But given current valuation levels, uh, keep in mind for things to become cheap, that means that prices have to go down. Uh, and we're not forecasting that either, at least in terms of when. We know what will happen. We just don't know when. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just add, um, markets can can remain frustratingly over or underpriced for years. Um, they, they they generally uh, ultimately reflect some economic reality over over decades. But the, these types of imbalances in the market, um, they're, they're, there's there's no natural mechanism for them to correct uh, in the short term. 
So they, they may, but but they can they can persist for a while as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Joy, very much. Great. Thank you, Betty. Um, next, we'll turn it over to Bill. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much for the presentation, gentlemen. Um, uh, you know, assuming that uh, this economy is driven by demand, um, and while the Fed has been very helpful in providing a backstop uh, on a lot of cap in the capital markets, um, and I know this touches upon one of those challenges that you don't want to, you didn't want to discuss, Alan, but I think there are a lot of people on the call uh, that might be able to weigh in, assuming that Congress doesn't come up with a significant fiscal fiscal stimulus uh, legislation, how do you see that impacting the demand side on the markets and therefore the economy going forward? Well, I can comment on that. And if it's challenging now, it will be even more challenging then. And that is, we're just beginning to see defaults. We're beginning to see bankruptcies. We're beginning to see the change in long-term unemployed versus short-term. We're beginning to see a significant amount of jobs literally evaporating. That's going to impact, and I defer to Gail and her team on what that's going to do to economies, but also to the revenues of state and local government. And absent some form of significant federal action, it's difficult to paint anything other than a bleak picture in the near term. Gail, do you do you have any perspective on this in terms of next year's budgeting? Um, <laughs> I, I somewhat agree with Alan that if I knew, I also wouldn't be on a Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think we are incredibly concerned about what the lack of congressional action for state and local assistance does to states' budgets across the country. I think there's a number of things. One, I think concerning for CalSTRS as well is that we start to see bankruptcies at local governments. Um, I think the controller remembers this well from the previous recession that we won't be able to do anything about. The, the federal act action in terms of the mun municipal investment vehicles are very troubled. The state becomes the backstop. And without some kind of intercept where the state would be guaranteed a certain return, I'm not sure that they're a vehicle that would be particularly helpful for even the locals because it, it could exacerbate the issues of state and local financing and the state's deficit. Um, just as troubling as you know is the unemployment insurance, the state essentially takes a loan from the federal government that we then pay back over time through what becomes a tax increase on employers in order to pay back this very large loan. And you know, the whether or not the feds forgive that is very unlikely. They haven't done that before. So that's another huge pressure on the state's budget. And then, you know, the I think that the spot of good news for the state, and this is what the controller was referring to, the the dichotomy between where we see the needs and the safety net programs and caseloads growing is somewhat offset by what we're seeing in terms of revenue because the state does depend so heavily, so heavily on high income people and capital gains. So there is, it's a dichotomy that's incredibly difficult writ large for society, obviously, because we have, we have to serve these people. We have to find jobs. They need to be quality jobs that people can live with. And we also need the revenue to pay for the safety net program. So revenues aren't as low as, as we were fearful of, um, but the, the need for the feds to step in is, I think, greater now than it ever was before, especially because so much of what we're paying for is a public health crisis. And the other thing I'll say about the feds is the supply chain issues we're seeing, whether it's for computers or digital divide or for testing or for PPE, we're creating such incredible pressures on our supply chains because the feds aren't creating any economies of scale to come in and help us purchase those items. And all of those items are actually what will slow the spread of COVID as well. Like really good testing, really good PPE. Um, those are the, the things that really help. So I think there are a lot of concerns about the interaction between 
the federal and state government. And I think um, Janet Yellen actually wrote a great op-ed in the New York Times, if you're interested in, in sort of how the federal government really can step in and mitigate some of the worst consequences in states. So I would refer you to that. I don't know if that answers your question, Bill. It, it helps, thanks. <laughs> it's a bleak picture. Yeah, and, and, and Bill, I, I would just add, um, not not to make it bleaker, but uh, in terms of the the disconnect between capital markets and uh, the real economy, uh, it is very clear that the capital markets right now are pricing in an expectation that there will be a fiscal stimulus package fairly soon, um, because I think most market participants believe um, well, it makes sense. So why wouldn't there be? So, so uh, the, I, I was. <laughs> um, most of you uh, live in a different world than that. Um, the uh, we, we and most others were surprised that the markets didn't didn't pull back when the the stimulus talks broke down in early August. Um, but the market has has kept this uh, uh, expectation that it's just a matter of time before before the sides kind of see see the merits in it. And so at some point, the delay will get long enough where Wall Street will pay attention. It just hasn't happened yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, so next, uh, we've got several more board members in the queue. We'll go to Gail and then Harry and Keith. So Gail, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Some of these questions, um, Alan and Steve, are, are for Chris as well. Um, I do want to drill down a little bit more on RMS. I'm I'm pleased that it performed well in March and April, but I do think RMS was set up to respond in a way of what we know from previous recessions. I don't know that this recession looks similar. I'm, um, so I have a couple of questions just about kind of how, what we would do in the future to, to correct it and whether or not there's any interest in, in redesigning it, especially given Alan's points about where interest was and what we do with these, um, you know, how, what our, what our investments look, look like, especially kind of given today's interest rates, do we need to reconsider long-term treasury bonds or at least not have, at least come up with alternatives that aren't the long-term treasury bonds? I, I do think the, the telling story of Alan's comparisons to 82 to today, to today can be maybe should be a lesson learned and, and what we do with that and what the strategy you're thinking about. Um, so I have kind of three buckets of questions, one around RMS, one around risk budgeting, which goes along with that. And then one just about kind of a, a work plan structure. So I'll get to the other two after that one. So, so why don't, why don't uh, Chris, I start with the R RMS and I'll hand it off to you for the implementation um, side. Uh, the, the, the first thing I want to highlight is that uh, uh, RMS, when it was uh, designed and modeled uh, by your staff, uh, was um, looking at bear markets, um, which by definition are, are pullbacks in the equity markets by more than 20%. That lasted three months or longer because the, the truly devastating uh, markets for defined benefit plans are the long-term bear markets. Um, so in that respect, uh, this bear market lasted something like 45 seconds before um, it, it recovered. Uh, uh, so it wasn't the classic bear market that RMS was designed for. That being said, it still protected really well. And the piece that protected um, the best was the long-term treasury piece. Uh, and that's that's the piece that is, that is expected to do well in sharp, quick downturns, um, the way uh, this uh, uh, bear market uh, evolved. Um, other, other components of RMS, uh, uh, such as trend following, are designed more for bear markets that might last three, six, nine months. So, uh, some aspects of this were were, were uh, 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 RMS was designed for. Some aspects of it, uh, the the market recovered before RMS. Other elements of RMS kind of kicked in. Um, and as I as I noted, staff is in the process of reviewing the the strategies within um, the RMS. And maybe I'll hand it over to Chris to chat about that evaluation process. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so uh, I'm 
going to ask Stephen Tong to go back in his files and send it to me, and I'll forward it to you tonight. Stephen Tong did an excellent paper at the beginning of RMS uh, on recessions, looking back through history. No recession resembles one that that uh, has come before it, so they're just varied and, and difficult, as Stephen said. The challenge with RMS um, is uh, the, the length of time. We've now had two recessions, 08 and now 2000, where 2020, where the Federal Reserve basically came in and backstopped the recession very quickly. So that, that really does change the dynamic. Uh, Stephen and his team have been looking for other things to add into RMS. We wanna come back to you if we can in November, but certainly in the first part of the year, uh, because the sub allocations to RMS, as, as Gail mentioned, the large weighting in, in uh, 30 year bonds and CTAs, was really a, a, a tough debate within the board and kind of a, a, a settlement uh, within the board of where they are. We'd like to run it through an optimizer and really see what the proper allocation should be. We know we can't design a perfect insurance policy that will cover every recession, especially one that is so quick um, as this one was, but we'll come up with one that, that we think can do well in different environments. The challenge also with the performance of RMS, we'll get into that in closed session, uh, really has to do with manager selection. We did not want to hire a ton of managers that would have driven up our fees. So we are fairly concentrated and, and some of our most popular managers that were very well known when we hired them are the ones that laid the biggest eggs uh, so far this year. So just has that added challenge, but the concept proved its worth and held its value. When you think about diversification uh, across this regime, it's not just RMS and fixed income. Uh, that's why we want to look at real estate. We want to look at tangible assets like infrastructure, because if inflation does come back, it's a big if, but if it does, then we want to hold a, a good amount of real assets because they will rise when inflation uh, surges. Thank you. That, that's really helpful. I look forward to that. Um, my second question before risk management is around real estate. I think, you know, a lot has been written to understand the need for tangible assets, but I'm curious about the pivot given the, the, the challenges and opportunities that this specific crisis presents, what, how, how will pivot in real estate and what the opportunities are? And then if, if in this question, if either Steve or Alan or, or Chris, if you could also kind of talk about private debt at, at the same time, I know they're a little bit different just for the sake of time. The one thing I would add is I think Ben is uh, from RCL Co is going to talk about the real estate portfolio and how things are changing dynamically with COVID. Um, Stephen, Alan, do you want to talk first about private debt? It is an area that we're looking at heavily. Yeah, I, I would just say from a, from a um, hundred thousand foot perspective, uh, uh, private debt, much like the rest of the, the asset classes in the capital markets, has uh, yet to um, uh, feel the significant pain of the recession. Uh, there certainly are uh, investments uh, that um, that are starting to uh, default. Uh, default rates are up in the high single digits now. Uh, but on the whole, private debt has... Um, uh, withstood the early phases of this recession uh, fairly well, uh, but much like everything else, there's, there's still there's still a long way to um, uh, a long way to go, and so I'll um, maybe have Chris uh, address any real estate items or you know other other comments on private credit specifically to Kelsters. If, if it's all right with the board's pleasure, I, I would like to talk about private debt, but do it in closed session. Uh, that's a key part of uh, Scott Chan's presentation on the collaborative model. And I don't want to forecast to the world uh, some of the areas we're looking at. I have said to you before, and I would repeat, uh, where in 08, uh, there were a lot of equity opportunities come out of the, coming out of the bottom of the 08 uh, global financial recession. Um, in this recession, we're really seeing very few equity investments to date. Uh, seeing much more debt opportunities. Uh, and I think that's an area that we're going to continue to focus on. Maybe Alan, just, go, ahead, go ahead, Scott. I was just going to say, we'll discuss this more in a closed session, but to um, to sort of echo Steve McCord's points, um, I think we, we we're in an advantageous position in the sense that we don't have a lot of private debt or private credit. 
And, and so we're not likely to, to suffer from um, the potential of a default cycle. But as Steve, Stephen was saying, a lot of, a lot of the uh, private credit managers that we know have actually weathered it pretty well because they have different um, contracts and different terms on a private basis that they're able to structure that you can't structure on a public basis. Um, but that being said, if we look forward in the cycle, um, we're looking at um, debt managers where we're going to be high in the cap structure. It's going to be backed by some assets. And so this, this um, blend of, of being able to achieve those types of things also has a lot of defensive qualities right now when, when we're sort of at the bottom of, of the cycle. Um, so I, I, I think that um, we're, it, it depends on your starting point, right? So if we had a lot of private debt right now, we, we'd be very worried about um, how that default cycle will, will play out. And indeed, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're concerned about uh, where we have been investing in debt. But I think on an opportunistic basis, since uh, we're well, well below our peers, probably a third or a quarter or a fifth of where our peers are in terms of their positions in private credit, I think um, on an optimistic basis, we should be able to take better advantage of um, the debt markets as, as on a going forward basis. And because the public markets have recovered so quickly, even on the debt side, I mean, one of the thing, one of the phenomena here is that we're, we're competing against the Fed and all the liquidity that's out there for you know, lower and lower interest rates on the public side. That's been one of the unique phenomena of, of this uh, crisis. Um, so on, on the private side, there, there is um, likely a lot more opportunities for us to structure the right deals, um, achieve better yields. And, um, and I think that we'll go about more about this, sorry, we'll go more in depth in the closed session, but I just wanted to provide a few comments before we do that. Really helpful, thank you. And my, my final question just about the, the status of risk budgeting implementation, I do think um, you're, you were very pernicious in, in seeing the importance of risk budgeting in addition to benchmarks as a measure, especially as we, even in good times, we couldn't quite get to the 7%. I, I think it's just gonna be really helpful in terms of telling our story and understanding it. Um, in addition to risk budgeting, I am curious about our kind of our big tech concentration and if, if that's included in your risk profile and how you're going to incorporate those types of concentrations more broadly into the risk budgeting implementation that you're going to go through. I don't know who to direct that to. So. Well, no, I'll take it at the beginning. The quick answer is, Gail, is yes. Uh, the, the concentration on large cap is included in our risk budget. We're breaking those kinds of stats out in the emails to you at the board, uh, but I'll kick it over to Scott to get into the details. Sure. Yeah, I, the risk budget is a very important initiative for us because we see it as aligning the risk with with the board. So again, if we talk about the strategic asset allocation that the board has just recently set in our four-year implementation plan to get there, the risk budget really puts the um, parameters around how we're going to execute and how we're going to use our active risk to generate active returns. And so we want to continue to move that forward and go asset by asset class to the degree that at the end, we can set an overall risk budget uh, for CalSTRS. And we think it ties in well with our execution plans um, as we look at the collaborative model. As you know, there are different risks that an, orga an organization can take. Our preferred risk taking is on the execution um, based on the strengths of the team. You know, can we select managers and the right partners and take the right execution risks rather than other types of risks that are out there. Obviously, you could take leverage risk or, or other types of risks. Um, but with that execution risk, we want to make sure that everything that we're doing is consistent with the type of retor return we need commensurate with that risk. Um, so as, as Chris was saying, we're, we're monitoring the, uh, the risk budget, uh, particularly in global equities, where there can be in, in the markets today a fair concentration of technology because those values have, have certainly in many cases doubled from, from where the starting point was. And I'm not gonna go into detail, but uh, Ju June Kim and, and the Global Equity team, as well as our, our risk team led by Geraldine, um, they break out all these risks in, in very minute detail and how each, each part of the risk budget is actually attributed to different sector risks, different region risks, different um, the, the overall risk of the market. 
So we can provide that level of detail, but what we've been trying to do is, is, is provide an overall report to the board um, that's, that you'll see included in Chris's CIO report. Um, so we're open to, to suggestions if you want to see more detail, but, but that's really be, being monitored uh, closely here. Yeah, I think um, I would be curious and, and defer to the, the chair and vice chair on this, but I, I, I am curious to see sort of as we, as we, our risk management budget evolves, sort of how we're incorporating risk mitigation strategies sort of more clearly in each of the asset classes. I think that could be a helpful way to understand where the risks are, how we're mitigating them, not just in RMS, but kind of writ large as we as we work to assess risk in each of the, the asset classes. I think that could be really helpful, especially as we really look sort of down the barrel of, of much lower returns for this next year and, and what that means for for the state, I, I think will be a kind of an important question to make sure we we understand what what we may be looking at. And I think you're uniquely situated from all the pension funds in the state to be able to really look at that question through this model. Uh, thanks, Gail. And I think what I'll do is work with Joy on trying to find some time at a future meeting to have uh, Geraldine and the risk team really present uh, the underlying risk within each asset class and how we move to mitigate those. Obviously in global equity, uh, because June follows a tight risk budget, we're gonna have an index exposure to those mega cap names um, that continue to go up in shocking fashion. Um, our active managers are diversifying around that, but we have looked at that and studied past exposures and, and are paying attention to, to that concentration. Yeah, and it's both, I think Gail, I, I know what you're saying, we're, we're trying to mitigate any unintentional risks that we're taking um, that uh, we don't want to be taking, in other words, but we want to be very intentional on, on the other end and lining up all of our opportunities and making sure that uh, it's commensurate, right? So we're not taking uh, too little risk, but too much risk and not getting an adequate return on, on that side of it. I did forget to mention a little bit about the timeline. Uh, the next risk budget presentation that you'll see is going to come from the SIS team as we were stating in the last uh, meeting, we set the benchmark, the global equity benchmark. And, and so in, in November, they'll be bringing forward a, re a recommendation for a risk budget. And then subsequent to that, most likely in the March to May timeframe, most likely March, uh, we'll be bringing forward a fixed income risk, risk budget. So, so maybe as early as November, we'll have the, the fixed income team begin to present uh, their their thoughts on the risk budget and how it applies to their asset class. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, Gail. And I know you had a question on real estate, but we'll just make sure we address some of those issues when our consultants come on. Um, and Chris, look forward to working with you and um, and Harry on thinking about how we bring these items back. So I think in addition to the questions that Gail raises, um, I know that as part of um, potential next steps with our um, our work plan around the transition to a low carbon economy, the SIS team is also looking at evaluation of, kind of ESG risks in some of our asset classes. So, um, it, you know, slightly different, but um, to the extent that we can get um, kind of a holistic view, I think that that may be something to work toward. Um, we do have um, Keith and Harry, but as, as vice chair of the committee, I just might, maybe wanted to ask Harry, um, if Keith is okay with it, is there something that you want to add to this conversation happening right now? Yes, Joy, it's actually on point. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, a few years ago, we asked the staff to begin to do a cost report, a comprehensive course cost report, and we've been receiving that on an annual basis. And I think it provides transparency. It's uh, and we're measuring the cost. And as Alan said, that's one of the areas in which we have some control over. The capital markets are gonna return what they return to us. And um, so we should focus, I really think on what we have control over. And the cost report is one. And I think when we go into closed session, we're gonna hear a lot more about some of the uh, collaborative models, the SMAs, the co-investments, uh, where we're trying to con control costs and capture keep more of our dollars to be invested and grow on a compounded basis. So I think that's critically important to continue to focus on that report and probably at some point separate out 
uh, will have a separate column that deals with the collaborative model, co-investments, SMAs, et cetera. But as it relates to risk budgeting, that was a policy that the board adopted after thorough discussion. And we went through an, uh, an extensive process of educating the board and hearing from our consultants and, and the staff as to why this policy shift was important. And Chris has just emphasized it, Scott has emphasized it, but I think it should be a request, a formal request from the committee that we begin to receive updates on the implementation of the risk budgeting. I think the um, semi-annual report does a great job in showing if you're overweight certain sectors or underweight other sectors or overweight certain regions or underweight other regions, that those types of shifts can make a material difference in returns growth versus uh, value, for example. We all know what they are, they're in the reports. So I think it's important for us in our oversight and monitoring role to actually get those types of reports as to how the staff is implementing the risk budgeting, how they're going through their decision-making process. And I'd just like to make that as a formal request, although our staff, our CIO and deputy CIO have said they're gonna bring that to us and it's a plan. I think this, the, from a committee, we should embrace that. Thank you, uh, Joy. Great, thank you, Harry. Um, I um, wholeheartedly um, concur with you on that. So I, I know Chris and Scott, you both agree because you you said that on the on the meeting today. But we'll um, you know we'll make some time following this um, to kind of put together a formal plan for how we'll how that'll be structured, frequency um, back to the board, and um, address those kinds of issues with Harry. Great. Okay, um, Keith, I'll turn it over to you. You had some questions. Yes, thank you. Um, couple questions. I guess it's for uh, Steve and Alan. The, you alluded to the Fed's recent action, and, and I think um, the, the Fed chair referenced the, um, in uh, the discussions about that with, uh, as a uh, recognition that there's the Fed's second purpose to deal with employment or unemployment may be driving some of this concern. And um, but how the Fed can actually do it through its fiscal policy is something else. What the, uh, uh, to the importance of federal action and perhaps even uh, uh, advocacy on federal action may be, may be something that uh, uh, will be gaining uh, or increasing. Uh, but I wanted to ask um, Stephen and Alan uh, the, the the relationship or the effect of the Fed's discussion about that they're no longer going to fight inflation in as quickly, let's say, or inflation will be less significant, which means that the increasing interest rates uh, um, may be delayed. So that means just a longer term, lower interest rate environment, at least from the Fed standpoint. Doesn't that exacerbate the or I don't want to say it in negative terms. Doesn't that affect uh, Alan's uh, observation that it, that uh, the low interest environment is going to be uh, part of the headwinds that we face? And what, if anything, can the board do uh, or Cal Sturs do in, in light of that environment? Perhaps not talking about invest in this or invest in that, but is there anything else that the board might be able to do to address that? It's a longer term issue, but, and should not necessarily affect, uh, although it will politically, but it should not necessarily affect a, uh, the annual returns. It's a much longer term, longer perspective, but what can we do? Because I recall, Alan, in, in 1982, that although the bonds, you know, the interest rate was very high. So was the inflation rate. And uh, people were still falling behind no matter what kind of interest they were earning. Um, here, perhaps we still are if interest is 3%. I mean, if, excuse me, if interest is very low and inflation is 2.7 or 3%. But um, what are we just passive victims to that and we can just do it on, as you said, on the edges of investment choices or are, are there other things that we uh, 
we might be able to do? Well, let, let me try to answer that question. Um, within each asset class, there are components that have a higher correlation to inflation. So in fixed income, it's treasury inf inflation protected securities. Uh, in real estate, it, it could be high quality industrial offices with a CPI escalator built into the rent structure. Um, and that would go for a, a variety of assets. It could be floating rate notes in the fixed income market. So just incorporating the potential for inflation to increase, uh, that can get reflected in the outlook in each asset class. And I think that's part of what each asset class looks at on almost a daily basis as they consider what is the range of opportunities that's presented to them. But writ large, uh, whenever there is the next strategic asset allocation, at that point, there might be a significant discussion on how to model for the, the potential for higher inflation. Um, uh, Chris, do you have any follow-up comments in response to Keith's question? Uh, no, I think Alan hit it on the head. It's a challenge within uh, the, the Fed's move was very significant and we're all digesting exactly what it will mean in a couple of years when inflation starts to come back. Got it. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you. Um, thanks. I think that's all the questions we have um, from board members on this particular, um, on this semi-annual report. So um, thank you, Steve and Alan. And I think now we're going to real estate. Um, so we'll turn it over to, um, to Ben and Taylor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, ben Maslin and Taylor, uh, Taylor Mammon from RCLCO here uh, to present on the real estate semi-annual report. Um, just a reminder that that our report is as of uh, March 2020. There's a lag in the reporting of, of private markets, which includes uh, the real estate portfolio. Um, so uh, I, I don't have control of the slides. Is there? Uh, should I just say next slide? We want to go to the next slide. Yes, please. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> So, so as of um, March 2020, um, the real estate portfolio uh, comprised approximately $33.8 billion, which was 13.7% uh, of the portfolio, um, and um, which is in compliance with the target allocation. Nope, oh, looks like we lost our, our slides. Um, but, and and uh, the sub, uh, sub allocations by strategy as well as by leverage, we're also in compliance with where the policy limits are. So across across risk type by core value added and opportunistic, and then by the the loan to value ratios across each of the um, the the uh, portfolio pieces. There. Um, next slide, please. Looking at performance, um, performance has has really been impressive across um, all time periods. Um, and um, just a reminder for the investment committee, we present um, performance um, with including what are described as legacy assets and excluding legacy assets. And legacy assets are closed end uh, commingled funds that were invested in prior to the uh, great financial crisis, so more than 10 years ago. And that, that portion of the portfolio has steadily diminished um, over time. But just focusing on the returns, um, including legacy to start, um, over the 10-year period, um, the portfolio has matched its benchmark, which is the, o the Odyssey Index. And then if we look at, at more recent time periods, has really started to outperform um, by uh, 110 basis points over the five-year period, and then um, 200 basis points over the, the three-year period, and then 130 basis points over the past year. Now, if we look at... at excluding legacy assets, which are now we're looking at the, the actual active portfolio that staff is managing the outperformance really increases and over the 10-year period by 130 basis points, um, but, but really over more recent periods, um, um, even more. So um, over the five-year period, um, 
the uh, the performance and the three-year period performance has exceeded the, the benchmark by over 300 basis points in each, each of those respective periods. And then over the last year, by 460 basis points. So, so um, more than double the benchmark's performance um, over the past year. Next slide, please. Um, looking at, at how the size of the portfolio has grown, this is the net asset value of the portfolio. Um, and and we're, we're at about $35 billion um, today. And about 70% of that is, is uh, considered under staff's control. And by that, we mean that it's comprised of, of more direct vehicles, such as separate accounts and programmatic joint ventures um, with real estate operators. Uh, the legacy portfolio, which was nearly half of the, um, the overall real estate portfolio 10 years ago, is now just $1.1 billion and, and really is, comprises uh, approximately 3% of the portfolio today. And, and as I mentioned, it will continue to diminish um, going forward. Um, next slide. The um, Next slide, please. The, the, if we look at the allocation by risk profile, um, the, uh, the, the portfolio today is about two thirds allocated to core assets, which are more, more stabilized in nature and, and therefore less risky, um, with, with the remainder, um, allocated to value add assets. Those are assets that typically require some level of, of repositioning or risk and then opportunistic assets, which are the, the more risky assets in terms of um, including speculative developments, for example. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the allocation to core has really increased over the last several years, where if we, were, if we go back five years, that was just 50% of the portfolio. And that, that has positioned the real estate portfolio, um, I would say, well for where, where we are right now, which is uncertainty. Um, and so, so the majority of the portfolio in less risky assets, it, it, it does decrease risk. Um, over time, that, that will change a little bit as we enter a recovery based on forward commitments where the, the core portfolio is projected to decline to approximately 60% um, to take advantage of, uh, of risk as, as we enter a, a, an economic recovery. And the legacy portfolio is projected to decline from about 3% to 1% in two years and, and within five years should nearly evaporate. Um, next slide, I'll turn it over to Taylor to talk about the market outlook. And, and in this section, Gail, we'll, we, we haven't forgotten about your question. We'll address your question as well. So Taylor, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Ben. And uh, good morning. It's great to see everybody. Um, I'm sure there are lots of questions. There, that, that's uh, that's a, a condition of our time is uh, uncertainty leads to lots of questions. And so we'll we'll try to address these to the best of our ability and with the help of our pistol ball. But um, Look, look forward to the discussion any, in any case. Um, the way that we are um, thinking, one of the ways in which we're thinking about the impacts of COVID-19 and the resulting downturn on, on, uh, on, on real estate is, um, is to look at the direct impacts and the indirect impacts. Uh, with, as you might expect, direct impacts having more immediate and significant impacts on the performance of individual properties and property types, uh, including on returns as we see on this page. Uh, direct impacts result from closures and changes in consumer behavior resulting from the pandemic. Uh, directly impacted properties are seeing immediate or near-term declines in income in particular. So for example, with more limited travel, uh, hotels and markets that depend on tourism are significantly impacted. The elimination or significant reduction in retail therapy or retail as entertainment, it, except for online purchases, uh, has, has of course impacted retail properties. Um, employees working from home, which is leading some companies to rethink how they utilize office space. There seems to be an article in the paper about this every day, impacts office properties. Um, Whereas on the flip side of the coin, the pandemic is directly impacting some property types in positive ways. For example, industrial properties have barely missed a beat. Uh, given significant growth in e-commerce, uh, data centers are expanding to accommodate increasing use of the internet for all aspects of life and therefore demand for server space. 
uh, indirect impacts uh, look like those that we see in previous recessions. Um, they result from the broader implications of an economic slowdown, particularly job and or income loss and tightened capital markets, um, such as uh, the greater difficulty acquiring debt, more limited buyer pools for certain assets and uh, indirect impacts include challenges by renters in meeting their rent obligations. The the conversation about whether um, uh, assistance to American households um, uh, will be extended or not has significant implications for the, the apartment industry, for example, so that uh, the households continue to meet those payments. Um, and greater under uncertainty about the future has led to fewer transactions, which creates uh, greater uncertainty about values. And at least right now, uh, in spite, um, I think our expectation, uh, which, which is shared, which, which we share with, uh, with 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 Makita, that interest rates will go lower. Right now, uh, they are higher. The cost of capital is generally higher, um, at least for many types of real estate and transactions. And equity investors are demanding higher returns on their investments, just to account for what we currently are experiencing as, um, uh, as uncertainty. So the entire system slows down. Um, from a return standpoint, which you can see on the charts on this page, the net result um, of these direct and indirect impacts started to be felt primarily in the second quarter of 2020, when the Odyssey benchmark earned a negative 1.75% return primarily dragged down by retail, followed by office. As you can see in the left chart on the screen, industry participants expect the benchmark to continue to be negative for the year 2020, again, driven by challenges in retail and office. It's expected to turn positive in 2021, uh, though still negative on appreciation and experience a slow recovery thereafter likely largely due to expectations about a lower return economy that, uh, that, 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 that we've been discussing. Um, of course, there's significant discussion and debate regarding the future of real estate post-pandemic. Um, and this uncertainty suggests both risks and opportunities, um, which staff is engaged in looking for clues um, to be able to interpret and, uh, and, 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 and translate into investment strategies. So a, a couple of thoughts on this, um, which we're happy to discuss further. Um, first, as you can see from these industry forecasts, the market really implicitly is expecting the pandemic to come under some level of control uh, by 2021, allowing both income, and property values to increase. Second, observers expect more variance of performance or more variation of performance by different property types. Um, we've all engaged in these debates and would love to have a long conversation about it, but to be brief, uh, we, our CLCO, are confident in long-term demand and good performance for industrial and all types of housing, similar to what we see uh, in the industry forecast and less certain about the future of office and retail. Again, this creates both risks and opportunities for all of these property types, uh, which staff is diligently researching and exploring and which we'll discuss in greater detail, um, or anticipating discussing in greater detail in, in closed session. Um, but just to, to be clear, I've been talking about current, uh, current conditions in the near term. I think longer term to respond to the earlier conversation, we agree with the capital market implications that have been discussed, that we're entering what is likely to look like a, a, a lower for longer environment. And again, in closed session, we can talk about um, some, of the, some of the specific strategies that staff is engaged in regarding that. Um, right now, uh, the, real estate is, the, the real estate market is experiencing a pretty broad spread, historically broad spread between uh, underlying interest rates, the 10 year treasury, for example, and uh, cap rates and discount rates, which are the primary means by which real estate assets are valued. Meaning um, you, you can earn pretty high, if you can get interest, if you can get debt, you can earn very high returns on real estate. Um, we think, however, that over time, these spreads narrow, they typically do. 
um, which leads to pretty significant uh, capital gains, real gains in, in the medium term. But over the long term, um, we, we expect core real estate returns to moderate relative to what we've experienced in the past. Finally, one, one reminder though, is that re real estate benefits from being an, a, a private market. It's, it's inherently inefficient um, and there are always opportunities to, to earn returns. Um, in, in the space, if you're looking for where demand is going and, and, and where capital is inefficient, it also benefits particularly at CalSTRS from the collaborative model, which is, light, which is able to gain additional returns just simply by saving on fees um, uh, relative to the benchmark. So that's something that, um, that, of course, the board and staff continue to support. So with that, I will uh, open it up to any additional questions. Thanks very much, Taylor, and thank you, Ben. Um, would uh, are there any uh, questions that um, board members have? I know we we had a robust discussion uh, in the earlier session with our general consultants that touched on a, a number of the of the asset classes, um, and of course, I, I think Taylor and Ben, um, the the board will look forward to being able to get into a little bit more detail um, as appropriate in the in the closed session. Um, I, there aren't any, um, you know, specific questions that we have um, right now. I guess maybe one one question that I would just ask you, um, get, you know, given that this is a report that we receive twice a year, is, um, you know, just from a, a risk perspective, you know, are there is there is there a particular risk, um, you know, or, or takeaway that you would want to, you know, leave with the board? Um, you know, you, you've highlighted some of those in your your remarks overall, but just any anything significant that you want to sort of put a put an exclamation point on? Yeah, good good question. I mean, I'll I'll first discuss an offer an opportunity, if okay, and then a risk, and then Ben Ben can jump in. Um, uh, Chris mentioned earlier the opportunities surrounding debt, and um, debt uh, likewise is an important opportunity for real estate as well. Um, again, can speak in greater specifics during closed session, but I think it is public knowledge that CalSTRS is investing in, in debt and real estate and seeing uh, great opportunities, um, largely because of current illiquidity, relative illiquidity in debt markets that, that lead to uh, higher and, and, and more stable returns than, than, uh, than you might otherwise uh, anticipate. I think the... Um, the, the risks um, really arise around how properties are going to be used going forward. I think fortunately, CalSTRS portfolio is, re is relatively well positioned, uh, re relatively in particular to the benchmark. Um, and, um, and, and so we, we think it should continue to outperform. Nevertheless, there are going to be challenges in the retail portion of the portfolio. There have been to date. There are going to be challenges in the office portion of the portfolio. Um, haven't been experienced yet because office leases tend to be longer term and companies are continuing to pay rent. So we think there will be headwinds to that go, going forward. Again, I think it'll be mitigated by the fact that the, the office portfolio that CalSTRS has is of exceptionally high quality. Again, particularly relative to the benchmark. <laughs> So, 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 so it should do well, but um, but there 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 will be challenges long term, um, and uh, and I think staff is 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 well aware of those, um, and 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 doing what they can with their managers of uh, of these property types to to mitigate them as much as possible. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to jump in as well, and 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 uh, echo a lot of what Taylor just said, which is that. Um, you know, the, it, there's uncertainty associated with how space will be utilized um, coming out of the current crisis and, and you know, highlighting office and retail properties in particular associated with, with perhaps we have too much retail in the United States or uh, there will be an increase in telecommuting uh, with regards to office properties. Um, and if you look at, at CalSTRS portfolio, it's, it's under allocated to retail compared to its benchmark and its office portfolio is of extremely high quality and has therefore outperformed its benchmark um, over consistent periods. Um, the opportunities there are also in that um, that the debt is incredibly cheap today and that you can lock in a low cost of debt for the long term and, and therefore 
uh, get a higher levered cash yield as a result across the portfolio. Um, and that, that where uh, one, one property type may experience diminished demand, other property types reap those, those rewards. And that you see that in the, in the dynamic between brick and mortar, mortar retail uh, demand declining, whereas uh, the demand for e-commerce has driven greater demand for industrial properties. And you see that reflected in the projected returns on the chart here. I think you may be on mute, Joy. Thank you. I have a big note on my laptop that says, you know, unmute. Just <laughs> apparently that wasn't effective. So um, thank you. I, you know, I, I'm, I know that there will be more questions when we're able to get into some detail um, in closed session, but um, I really appreciate the report. Thank you. Thank you. We'll look forward to it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so then I'm uh, moving to the Final portion of agenda item five will receive um, our semi-annual report on private equity from John and Steve Hart. Thank you, Joy. So before we begin this, and we can go to INV 170, which is ahead two pages, I believe. I just want to note that it's a very interesting endpoint for the report. March 31 was just weeks away from the shelter in place orders. And also it was very close to the bottoming of the stock market. So we're gonna show in our report, some comparisons to stock market indices. And it's worthwhile bearing in mind that there was a huge rebound that happened. It started within kind of days of, of the snapshot that we're using as the endpoint for this report. So please bear that in mind. So if you could go ahead, I believe two slides. Okay, that's perfect. I just want to note here that while, um, actually back one, excuse me, that while at this snapshot we show an exposure of a little over 10% to private equity, that that has subsequently uh, been, been reversed due to the strong performance of the stock market. The current target or the interim target for private equity is 9%. And we're closer to that as of, as of today and uh, moving towards a long-term target of 13% with a, with a strong commitment pace. I'll note one thing about bias that continued to be the lion's share of the exposure. Uh, one thing that uh, you're aware of with the program is the increasing emphasis on co-investments. The lion's share of co-investment opportunities that the private equity team is going to see are going to be in the buyout asset class or sub subcategory, so that will tend towards a higher percentage of buyouts as that co-investment strategy is executed. But as of the snapshot of March 31, 93% uh, of the exposure was through traditional funds, and the balance was in co-investments. There's a, a longer-term target to move that 7% in co-investments more towards you know, 10 or potentially 20% of deployment. And that implies quite a bit of activity for the private equity team. And as you know, that they're hiring to meet that activity. And this will be met with very significant fee savings. And I'll illustrate with just a simple example. One co-investment at the size of 100 million without the carry structure of a typical fund, if it achieves a, a 2x return, gives you a savings of $20 million to, to the system. So I'll move to the next slide and, and simply note that the relative performance, and we have more detail on this later in our report, was strong as of March 31. Uh, we note also that that was the nadir for the public market indices, and that has a, a complicating factor in interpreting the, the figures that we show a bit later. Adjusting for cash flows, the portfolio value decreased 1.6 billion, but that was on a base of roughly $24 billion. So next slide, please. As you ramp up, you're, you're putting more in, into the market and you're biased more towards drawdowns than towards distributions, and that was the anticipated uh, effect that we saw for this period of time. The total program experienced a negative, negative cash flow of 1.8 billion for the semi-annual report period. But that's exactly as we had anticipated. 
Um, strong deployment pace is noted of the second bullet point, almost $5 billion deployed in just the first half of the current calendar year. And as is a theme that's come up with both, both real estate and other programs, CalSTRS uh, debt has been an area of particular interest for the private equity team. And there has been specific targeted investments made in opportunistic debt strategies to, to capitalize on the dislocation, investing in stress, which is uh, credits that are still paying interest and distressed assets that are either no longer paying interest or on the verge of, of not paying interest. I'll go to the next slide. Here I'll note again, uh, buyouts are the lion's share of the private equity program, as is as typical for programs of this size. And that will potentially increase or likely increase as there is a ramp up in co-investment activity. Most of the deal flow that the team will see in co-investments will come in, in the buyout category. And then also I'll again reiterate that the total program was showing a percentage of total market value of 10.2% versus the interim target of nine. Uh, but that was uh, the snapshot reflecting a, a brief moment in time with, with a significant denominator effect that has re since reversed. The next slide, I'll simply note that from a compliance point of view, the program was within all the diversification ranges. It is highly diversified on every metric that you can imagine. Um, it is denominated in mostly in dollars, however, 9% as many of the non-US investments while investing in local markets still are denominated in US dollars. And I'll, I'll turn over to Steve who will speak to the historical cash flows of the program and then speak to the performance of the program relative to various benchmarks. Yeah, thank you, uh, John, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Wanted to uh, uh, turn to the next slide there. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to highlight one aspect here. Um, uh, well, actually two. Um, uh, uh, John commented on this uh, briefly, but I wanted to, to emphasize that um, with the onslaught of, of COVID, um, the, uh, the staff um, obviously and, and, and everyone had to move to a, a work from home environment. and. As uh, uh, John noted in his comments, the uh, activity remained very high. You know, we remain in contact with the, the staff on a regular basis, and um, their their uh, investment pace, their um, rigor of their analysis remains uh, very high during this process. And uh, the the transition, um, you know, probably not uh, uh, you know. Uh, perfect in every way and, and not what everybody wanted to do, but um, was handled very well. And um, the, the staff is, is uh, executing very effectively. The second thing uh, on this chart, just looking at the, um, the last part, um, all the way over on the far right side, uh, the 2020, um, what that is showing is showing the um, amount of um, contributions and capital that's being drawn by the underlying uh, 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 funds and investments a total of 1.5 billion um, uh, through uh, March 31st, and then uh, a contribution of uh, 800, you know, distributions being received by the plan of 800 million. So the, to the topic here is that there was um, some significant concern by market participants and, and the staff did a, a really good job of, of reaching out to their um, uh, uh, underlying managers to get a perspective on what the future liquidity uh, and calls of capital would be. Um, and so they looking to, to manage that very carefully and, and um, you know, understanding that if there was a lot of capital drawn very quickly, it could put stress on, on the system. That turned out to, to not happen at the end of the day. There, there was not as much um, capital called uh, by the underlying managers. But uh, I'm just highlighting this because um, this chart could have looked different, um, but uh, the uh, staff, was very proactive in, in reaching out to managers to um, understand what their future uh, liquidity needs were going to be so that they could uh, be collected and, and be thought about from the total uh, program's perspective. If I can uh, uh, encourage the next slide here. Um, here is the performance and, and as uh, John had indicated, um, 
a couple of comments here. One is that the, uh, uh, the, the private equity program for the, the one year period uh, was indeed negative. Um, but uh, as we've talked about for a long time, that uh, uh, you know, looking at the, the longer term returns are uh, important. And also, as John mentioned, um, this was a snapshot as of March 31st, 2020. Um, and uh, all, all of the asset classes were, were down substantially uh, at that point. And um, the lag effect uh, 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 in private equity valuations just makes it this is the comparison period and um, the underlying uh, equity values uh, in the public markets have certainly improved. We'd expect there would be um, uh, some uh, important rebounding in the second quarter, maybe not completely um, uh, back to uh, the, the prior values, but expect that the private equities will have some recovery um, once we look at this uh, again in, in six months' time. Um, uh, in general, private equity values tend to move more slowly um, uh, going up and down uh, than the, the public equity values. Um, that being said, you can see that the, uh, the, the, the CalSTRS program uh, as, is showing some some nice outperformance compared to the uh, the custom State Street index uh, for the shorter periods. Um, uh, I think that looking through here, that there have been some uh, quite good results in the the buyout segment and the co investment segment uh, uh, in the Calster's portfolio. But uh, looking at, at such a one year period, there can be some some uh, just some mismatches in timing. So again, it's the longer time period that's that's important. And then uh, lastly, the final line there against the custom benchmark, which reminding the board that that is um, the uh, private equity oriented, uh, is the public equity uh, calculated uh, proxy benchmark, which really is used for very long term assessment of the, uh, uh, the program's performance. Um, so for the, the periods here, uh, March 31st, showing that the, the CalSTRS private equity program uh, showed some strong outperformance, but as John mentioned, uh, a bit of the, the endpoint, meaning that the, uh, the calculation date, March 31st, was a, a very low point in the, uh, in the valuation of the public markets. Um, I think that, uh, you know, just some further comments to, to have here that um, uh, the, the, the strategy that the staff is executing on um, is adding additional complexity to the portfolio from a couple of, of dimensions. Uh, 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 John did mention the couple of uh, opportunistic debt vehicles that um, the staff had been uh, executing on during the time period to try to potentially take advantage of uh, attractively priced assets. Um, there is continued focus on uh, SMAs, uh, special managed accounts to try to um, uh, achieve particular profiles. The uh, investments in um, uh, secondary managers um, looking to, uh, as we've talked before, about uh, longer dated and, and uh, multi-strategy assets. So the portfolio continues to get um, um, complex from a, a number of exposures, which is good to try to help uh, mitigate some of the, the very large uh, buyout exposure that's in the portfolio. Uh, that is just going to um, continue to, to grow, but looking for ways to um, uh, actively add some additional exposures into the portfolio. And then uh, the other area of complexity is, as John also uh, uh, indicated or highlighted on, the, the uh, collaborative model and the focus in private equity on, on co-investments. Um, as that continues to, to grow and they continue to build that, that program, um, adding the, the staff to be able to execute on that, um, as well as just managing the overall portfolio from a, a sourcing um, and execution perspective, as well as monitoring. Um, uh, John gave a quick uh, uh, illustration of the potential fee savings that can come from um, you know, a like-for-like -like, uh, investment and returns uh, in a fund, which would be fully loaded, the 20% uh, carry, versus a co-investment, which typically has uh, no carried interest. And the savings that can take place um, uh, by doing that is, is very, very substantial, um, but requires 
uh, uh, skills and uh, staff to be able to execute effectively on the opportunity set. Um, I'll uh, uh, stop my comments there and uh, uh, see if there's any questions um, um, from the board uh, or any comments that John wanted to uh, add before we would do that. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, John, were there any final comments you had before we open it up for questions? Not for me. Um, well, we, there aren't currently any questions from the board members. I think like um, uh, you know, some of the discussion we've had earlier, I think that there, are, there will be further um, you know, questions and discussion around some topics in closed session. Um, but before I let you go, uh, maybe I'll just ask uh, the same question that I did of our real estate consultants, which is you know, you've, you've um, provided some great information as well as kind of a um, you know, a look back as well as thinking about how things look going forward. Um, and I guess I would just ask if there's anything that you'd want to, um, you know, really underscore um, for the board, whether it's, you know, risks or, or opportunities or, or both. Sure, I'll, I'll um, take a first one there and, and um, John can, uh, can add some additional ones. I mean, I think I think one one aspect um, that's that's a very important part of the uh, private equity program is the fact that um, the the uh, investments are uh, and the portfolio is built through relationships with the underlying managers, and um, that's particularly important um, with the, the co investment side, but it's also in in the funds side as they deploy in that strategy. So. Um, Having um, uh, the the condition of COVID right now, which which puts um, a wrench into uh, uh, making those relationships work efficiently, when you can't have um, face to face meetings and you can't travel to offices and you can't um, visit facilities, is just um, some challenges. And, and none of us know how long uh, the situation is going to uh, going to last. Um, but uh, uh, the ability to uh, identify and um, get comfortable with new managers in the portfolio is going to be an important factor, you know, sort of down the road. Um, the staff's been able to execute very well with, with you know, with a, a strong reliance on the managers that they know well. Uh, but down the road, it's going to be important to, to look to um, uh, get additional relationships uh, refreshing the, the portfolio. Um, and then on the, the co-investment side, um, just having that, that trust and, and being a, a strong partner with the, um, uh, uh, the invest, the various you know, fund managers um, in the, the challenges that it uh, uh, provides you know, in this COVID environment um, is just going to be something that, that's going to have to continue to be addressed and thought through um, as the, the staff continues to execute. Great. Okay. Well, um, Steve and John, thank you very much um, for the uh, for the report and the update. Um, are there any um, uh, Samantha? Are there any um, public comments on this agenda item so number five? First, but, sorry, both. But both um, Betty and Harry have their hands raised. Oh. Okay. I um I don't see them. So uh, we'll go to um, uh, go to Betty perhaps. Actually, Joe, that was um, for our prior item, but I'm going to save it for closed session. Thank you. Okay, I, I apologize. I don't That's see okay. any hands raised on my screen. So, um, Harry, a uh, comment from you? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joy. Just very briefly, I um, appreciate the, all of the reports, the semi-annual reports, the verbal reports, as well as the documentation and the oversight for the uh, period ending June 30th, 2020. And I just want to, in a general way, comment and commend the staff and the consultants who uh, navigated this huge portfolio uh, during a very, very volatile period of time. And it just reinforces to me the importance of having um, you know, dedicated and calm maybe not calm at certain times, but dedicated, focused professionals who were able to help uh, 
ensure that we got through a very, very rocky period of time as best as we possibly could. It's easy to overlook that. But uh, I think um, when we look back in history, that those three months of March, April, May and June um, will probably be written about in the textbooks and having experienced staff working with consultants closely on a daily basis at times to uh, make tactical decisions and stay the course. Um, I think speaks volumes. So I wanted to commend everybody who worked uh, extremely well during uh, a difficult period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, really well said, and I appreciate you um, you uh, sort of wrapping up this item with that comment. And just apologies again to Harry and Betty that I um, I've got a question to the staff about how to make sure that I can see the hands raised because I, I I didn't see that on my monitor. Um, and uh, so just um, Samantha or Danielle, no no public comments on this item, is that right? No public comments at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, we've got one more item. It's um, to hear from our um, CIO, Chris, with his CIO report. I know that we are um, a bit over the, the time that we had scheduled and I, uh, I appreciate um, everybody sticking in there, but I think you know, as we all know, um, the, the dialogue that we just had with our consultants and staff is, um, Really important, and one of the you know probably job one that we have in terms of overseeing um, how we're doing with the with our fund. So appreciate everybody's engagement. Um, Chris, I'll turn it to you. Thanks, Joy, and I will be quick. And I echo the, your comments. Um, the semi-annual performance report, particularly this one, which is really the annual performance report, is critical to your monitoring of the portfolio. So don't hesitate to hang on to those pages. Refer back to them. Uh, and post questions, because uh, I can refer those to the consultants, we'd be happy to respond. Um, in the CIO report, I would uh, highlight uh, page INV196, um, chart three. It really shows you how stable the asset allocation is. Even though I talked to you uh, during the month and at mid-month about some of the tilts and adjustments we're making to the portfolio, when you really back up and look at it like that in the three-year period, you realize how stable the overall asset allocation is. Um, and then on uh, 197, the next page, chart four, it really shows, as, as uh, Steve McCourt and Alan Emkin commented, how risk just changed in a heartbeat. Uh, basically, the risk of the portfolio doubled in those few days at the end of February, the beginning of March, just remarkable. And then one other page to highlight, uh, INV 199. That is your new uh, report on global equity that will show their risk budget and where they are in their risk budget. And you can see the current level was 42. The range is up to 50. It shows you what we forecast and then what the actual experience is. <clears throat> and the actual experience, as you can see, is gonna adjust depending on how much active management and how far our bets are away from the benchmark. Uh, so probably the biggest thing you see there is how in 2004 it was much higher. That's because we had mismatches relative to the underlying benchmark in things like mid cap stocks. Uh, and we've tightened those adjustments dramatically. Uh, in my slides, I attached those this time to the uh, uh, report, uh, starting on page 208 instead of separating them. Um, I know we've been pretty dour. Uh, the economy is pretty scary in here and, and with the COVID crisis, uh, I think we're all really suffering from uh, kind of mental health challenges. It's hard to be upbeat. But remarkably, the stock market is an all-time record high again today. We're up almost 300 today. I am pleased to say the portfolio is at an all-time record high of $262 billion. I know some of the retired teachers like to report that out. So again, $262 billion as of the end of August. Uh, that is an all-time high close for us. And then uh, I would just highlight, uh, I've got graph pages on uh, uh, INV211. Uh, that show the stock market last year. We've seen that many times before. Uh, and then I think I'd highlight page 214. That's the yield curve. Um, and that's what we were just talking about earlier in the semi annual performance report is how dramatic that curve, you know, look at that, that zero, the, the short term one month rate all the way up to five years, hugging zero um, and almost flat. I don't think interest rates are going to go negative in the US for more than a day or minutes, uh, but rates are going to be low. Uh, and very low for a long time. And, and we will be back with more information on that. 
Uh, with that, I want to highlight, uh, I mentioned to you in our July report, I provide a personnel report to you. Uh, we had very low turnover, knock on wood, thankfully, last year at 4%. But I noted that most of the, over three quarters of our retirements were um, uh, our vet, or three quarters of our departures, pardon me, were our were retirements. Uh, and we're consider, continuing to see some of our veterans uh, announce their retirement, even in this, during this pandemic. Um, and so I want to highlight that uh, Deanna Winter, who is one of our stellar employees, uh, portfolio manager in private equity, announced her retirement. Um, uh, her husband is actually runs fixed income over at CalPERS. He's one of our spouses that has been between two pans. I've known Deanna um, my whole career. She's been fantastic. So with that, I want to turn it over to Margo to say a few words about Deanna's departure. Thank you, Chris. For the sake of brevity, I've just written out uh, five sentences here I'd like to read. Um, among the things that the CalSTRS private equity program is, is well known for is the uh, continuity and longevity of the staff. Uh, Deanna Winder was among a handful of staff who joined the PE program 20 years ago as the program was transforming from a one based mostly on outsourcing or in large part on outsourcing to one that's strongly staff driven. Over those 20 years, Deanna and the remaining team members from her cohort have been involved in over 500 private equity commitments, totaling $65 billion. That's a lot in this industry. Um, I believe Seth Hall spoke out for the whole team on Monday during our send off in the private equity group when he said he could not have hoped for a colleague who uh, was more earnest, reliable, friendly, and upbeat. And so I just, uh, I'm sure the rest of CalSTRS uh, joins me in wishing her well in retirement and um, thanking her for all of her many contributions to the teacher's retirement system. Thank you. Uh, she's watching her grandchildren today. Um, so she's not on, but she will be watching this. Thank you. Thanks, Margo. That seems to be a common theme of watching grandchildren. Thank you for the applause for her. Yep. We also uh, saw the departure of Eric Kwong. Eric was, I think, 25 years in the CIS unit. Uh, so uh, some very senior, uh, talented people. Scott and I, on the, on the flip side, are conversely very excited about some of the recent hires. Uh, I really want to put a collage together for you that shows you uh, the people from uh, APM all the way down to IO1, some really exciting people. And I applaud the staff for being able to continue to recruit and interview in this virtual environment. Uh, we're getting the work done. So with that joy, brevity, I'll turn it over to any questions to the, from the board. Thank you very much, Chris. And um, I know we, we maybe are, don't get to see Deanna and Eric's faces on here um, with us, but just wanna, um, on behalf of the board and the investment committee, just thank them for their years of service. Um, it's quite remarkable to think about the fact that you're, you're here announcing um, that, you know, today we've hit another all-time high for the fund. Um, and, you know, so much of that is thanks to what they've contributed and helped, helped you all to build over the years. So um, our heartfelt thank you and congratulations um, to two of our, our team members. Um, we have a, a couple of questions. Um, Sharon. Yeah, I just wanted to also, you know, lend my congratulations. It's, I, I just, um, it's, I, I'm always kind of in other organizations, just really struck by CalSTRS longevity that we have staff that stay so long and it's great to have our departures be uh, mostly retirements. That's, that's a good story to tell. I also really appreciate, I, I'm going to go back to our semi-annual report and I was struck by INV 27, Chris, that the chart that gives us because I love when you give us the high number of 262 billion, that's a, that's great. And I'm gonna, you know, send a text out to our members in, in LA. I know they'll be excited to hear that. But I also appreciate the long-term perspective that that is presented back in IMB 27 with those the circles. I think that helps. I think our members just see like, okay, it was 3.9% this year, which I think is an incredible accomplishment. But to look at the three-year, the five-year, the 10-year, and the the 25-year numbers. Um, to kind of keep your, when you report out, to kind of keep that long-term perspective, I think helps to see kind of for our members the sense that there's a lot of volatility in the market, but consistently over time, you know, we've met 
um, you know, met our goals and continue to, to strive to meet them and exceed them at times. So I think that's a really important story for us to tell too. So thanks for the good work. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Betty. Um, thank you, Joy. And I also want to offer my congratulations. I think in this uh, era of uh, just a lot of uncertainty and volatility, it's nice to just have the assurance of the stability and the longevity and the experience of the of the team. So thank you and congratulations. Um, Chris, I wanted to just ask you, um, you know, you've mentioned a couple times in terms of looking out at, um, to the horizon and also in terms of inevitable surprises, the um, potential contested uh, U.S. transition of power. And I was curious as to how the markets responded so far to that. Are they pricing any of this in or what's your observation there? Great question, Betty. Uh, the market really is not pricing in the election at this point, okay. and they're only thinking about the election. They're not thinking about the transition of power. Um, but I wanted to cite that as a concern. We've seen it from Ian Brenmer at Eurasia. Um, I think that uh, talking to the team, we think the markets will really start focusing in on the election probably in mid-October. And mostly will be the discussion about the presidency and then the House uh, and mm -hmm. uh, or Congress rather, and and which way that will go in the future policy implications. I am though deeply concerned that we will not have either candidate concede, uh, and that we may find ourselves uh, with a contested election. We saw that in the year 2000. It was peaceful. Obviously, there was some excitement in Florida. Um, but the markets managed through it and, and because they were not looking at, I think, such extreme points of view as we are today. So I think that's a risk on the horizon. Uh, the team is looking at that. We're gonna be fairly defensive, uh, but we also don't wanna take risk off because uh, you can't fight the Fed. Just like we discussed earlier, these markets are all time highs, mostly due to the Federal Reserve and, and this put that they've almost put on the market. So it will be challenging and I think we'll have longer discussions with the committee at the offsite and then a lot of communication with you as we get through October. Um, I pointed out to the team, I remember four years ago, uh, there was a 93% chance of one candidate winning and everybody was pretty confident and pretty relaxed going into the election. I don't think that's gonna be true for the market this time. I think it's gonna be very uncertain uh, and it, it should cause volatility in the market, but I say should because, uh, as I pointed out with the uh, Robinhood traders, uh, the lack of, frankly, professionals moving the market, we've just seen really strange behavior out of this market, and we may continue to um, as we get closer to that, that pivotal point. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you for monitoring that. And then I know the market's obviously been responding to the COVID crisis, but what about uh, pricing in the pandemic? Yeah, the, the market seems very, it, it, the market typically looks six months ahead, but again, typically, because mm -hmm. I, I can't emphasize enough what a different market this is. There are so few traders at the firms, they're all at home, uh, and we're still seeing such a huge volume out of the retail, what I call retail, the, the Robin Hood trader operating from home. Uh, normally, we would expect to see these markets uh, price in uh, six months ahead. With the market at an all-time high, it's acting as if the economy is going to be fully back to normal, a full vaccine, the virus eliminated six months from now. That's hard to see. I, I'm still optimistic that we will see some kind of a vaccine toward the end of the year, but the problem is still going to be distribution. I yeah. mean, you have simple logistics like the amount of glass in, Amer in the world to create vials for a vaccine for every human being in the world. Um, so I think the rollout is still going to be choppy. I, I would expect this market, it, it feels overextended, but I would have told you that in July. Mm -hmm. And yet here we are, uh, one of the strongest Augusts we've seen in, in 20 years. So I just don't want to overestimate what this market can continue to hold, but I would agree with all the comments. And on, on the risk allocation team, I'm more of a bearish person because I, you know, you drive around and you see one out of every three stores vacant in retail malls uh, and local shops. Um, there's just real pain on Main Street that Wall Street is not recognizing. Yeah, real disconnect. Yeah. So it's a disconnect. It normally, as Alan said, it's going to revert to the mean and recorrect, uh, but it can stay in this this strange out of balance uh, for a long time period, as much as six months. Mm -hmm. 
Great, thank you. Thanks, Joy. Great, thank you, Betty. Okay, um, Chris, I think no other questions. So thank you very much um, for the report and um, for helping uh, you know add to the discussion that we had earlier this morning on our semi-annual reports. Um, so we will um, break at this point, um, and I think that we are scheduled to reconvene at one o'clock. Um, if everybody could try to get back online a few minutes before then, so we're ready to go at one, that would be great. Um, we'll finish up the open session with a discussion um, presentation about um, our work plan on the transition to a low carbon economy, um, have a short break, and then go into closed session. So everyone have a, uh, have a nice lunch, refresh, walk around a little bit, and um, we'll see you back at one o'clock. Thank you.
um, a discussion of our work plan, the status of our work plan on the transition to a low-carbon economy. Um, so I think I'm turning it over to Kirsty, Brian, and Chris. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Chris, are you starting off? No, straight to me. Great. <laughs> Well, hello, everybody. Thanks very much. Brian, I'm Kirsty Jenkinson, the Director of the Sustainable Investment and Stewardship Strategies team. I'm joined with Brian Rice, who will introduce himself, and we'll be doing the bulk of the discussion today with all of us. But just a few words, if we could maybe go to the slides that I'm hoping that we have stacked up and ready if everybody has access to, please, to guide us. What we're hoping to do is we did provide quite a detailed memo in the materials, um, but this tries to just summarize some of the highlights to navigate through it. So if we could go to the next slide, please. And I'll just um, start with a few um, comments of introduction. Basically, just to sort of clarify, as I think we all know, you know, the acute recognition that we have for the extensive social and environmental um, and economic challenges associated with climate change. And I think myself, the CIS team, the broader investment staff know that our job and our responsibility to you, the board, is to make sure that we have access to and use the very best and the most objective data, information and research to help us translate the enormous sort of complexity of climate change into meaningful actions that can protect and enhance the value of the investment portfolio going forward and also support the transition to a low carbon economy. But being the second largest fund in the US, as you know, affords us incredible access to global expertise from policymakers, financial analysts, investment peers, sector and asset class specialists, think tanks, nonprofits across the board. Um, and this access to these experts help us manage and hopefully mitigate the risks and opportunities in what is still an evolving area of investment analysis. And we are able to do this in the most timely and appropriate ways. And while I think you obviously recognize the history that Calstas has in understanding environmental risks, the acceleration in the shift to a low carbon economy, which as we know is discussed a lot at the last meeting, driven by policy, by technology, by economics, has necessitated that jointly the board and staff has a very systematic and comprehensive work plan to sort of guide our activities. And so in addition to the write-up that we provided, Brian and I are going to um, present a brief update on the low carbon transition work plan You'll remember that we established this last year in May, and we are agreed our priorities with you at the October offsite, where we dedicated a whole sort of second day to hearing from numerous experts to staff and to a discussion between board and staff as well. So I'm going to hand over to Brian now, really to sort of highlight what we think is our progress report, but also really call out to you as well the significant amount of work that we know has to be ongoing um, as we look out to the portfolio over the next years ahead. So if I can have the next slide and hand over to Brian. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Brian Rice, uh, Portfolio Manager in the Sustainable Investment and Stewardship Strategies Group. Um, so, so going back to the October 2019 board offsite, there was a lot of discussion around goals and objectives uh, for this work plan. Uh, but the board did distinguish three priorities for staff, and you can see these here. Uh, first one was around a, a low carbon investment belief. Uh, second was doing transition readiness assessments. And the third was expanding investments in low carbon solutions. Uh, staff kept these priorities uh, in focus, as well as some of the other objectives that were discussed at the offsite when we were building out the work plan. And as you'll see, this work plan consists of, of five distinct uh, what we call work streams. And then each one of these work streams has a number of initiatives. Um, before I move on, I just want to point out these, these icons to the left of each of the priorities. Uh, more than just colorful graphics, we're actually using them to, to identify how the board priorities have been woven into the initi um, initiatives within the work streams. So can we go to the next slide? So here are the five work streams uh, uh, that we came up with. Uh, the first one focuses on consensus, understanding how the transition is occurring uh, and, and what are the most likely impacts of the portfolio um, and, and through that developing actions and strategies that are most appropriate. Second work stream is, is assesses Transition readiness um, is an asset more or less likely to perform well during the transition, why or why not? Um, as we've heard from previous sessions, transition is impacting or will impact assets differently. Uh, so this work stream analyzes transition readiness from an uh, asset class level. A third work stream, um, looking to grow exposure to climate solutions. 
Uh, demand for renewable energy is growing. Uh, these investments we think could, could be uh, additive to the total portfolio return. This work stream looks to develop capacity to make such investments. Fourth work stream focusing on stewardship. Uh, certainly CalSTRS has long been very active at climate change, uh, stewardship engagement advocacy. The focus of this work stream is expanding those efforts in support of the low carbon transition. And then the last work stream uh, on communications. Uh, it's important that we report on our efforts and accomplishments and we do so in an effective, efficient manner. Uh, so this work stream is focusing on improving communications. Uh, the next few slides I go through, actually the next five slides, each one is dedicated to a particular uh, a work stream and, and shows the different initiatives. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I think a lot of what uh, I'm going to point out is in the agenda item, INV 218 uh, to 224. Certainly happy to provide or answer any questions or provide uh, uh, some more commentary if, if it's in indicated, if you see something here that you like more information on. I think also I want to point out these are snapshots. Um, essentially, they're taken from a larger uh, Excel spreadsheet that we use to track the various initiatives within the work streams that make up the work plan. Uh, hopefully, this gives you a better picture of how we are, are tracking our efforts and our progress. And, and for each one of these next slides, you'll see shows what the initiative is, uh, how we think this ties back to board priorities. Again, these are the icons I pointed out. Uh, status for each initiative, it's either pending, ongoing, or complete. And then a few bullet points around the progress uh, uh, and, and what we think we will be doing going forward. So for this particular work stream, which is around building consensus on, on impacts, Certainly, I'll, I'll kind of walk you through this one. Uh, the initiative is the low carbon investment belief. Certainly ties directly back to the, that priority. Uh, uh, it's complete because in January 2020, we were able to get that approved. Um, in terms of the board uh, education initiative, uh, the, the educational speaker series that we've been, uh, has been ongoing since the offsite will continue. We certainly think this aligns with it, set the foundation for the um, uh, for the investment belief and certainly helping us in terms of transition readiness. And then around uh, the climate research and data initiative, I just want to point out we've got a, a good collaboration going on with the, with the risk team. We've got Josh Dietish as part of our, our low carbon transition team, certainly bringing good perspective in terms of total portfolio risk and how each asset class is managing risk and quite valuable, particularly in helping us understand data and analytics that we need going forward. Next slide. Uh, so turning to the transition readiness uh, work stream, I want to point out we, we're calling this a sequenced evaluation. I think from a resource perspective, we certainly couldn't do all asset classes at once. We thought that we could probably manage, manage two. So the way we're going to do it is, as you know, we, we're working on two now. As one rolls off, we'll be bringing on another uh, asset class to assess the transition readiness of that portfolio. As you can see, our first uh, collaboration was the real estate group working together with, with, with the real estate team, looking at, at the expert climate expert analysis, seeing what peers are doing, recognize that physical risk uh, was most impactful, extreme weather events, you know, sea level rise, flooding. Uh, we've researched platforms that support physical risk management, performed a lot of due diligence. I think about a half a dozen risk assessment platforms. I uh, believe we've ID'd the best provider and we're really close to finalizing terms of service and bringing them on board and we'll work with the real estate team to integrate uh, that platform going forward. I also started our assessment uh, of public equity, kind of early conversations with that group. How can we support what they're doing in terms of transition assessment? Um, perhaps uh, more importantly, um, now that we have the low carbon index in the SIS portfolio, uh, we can do a review of that. Looking at some transition readiness products, we think that will necessarily naturally provide a better understanding of companies and markets and how they're integrating a transition readiness uh, uh, in the public markets. Next slide. Uh, so within the climate solutions investment work stream, I, obviously the big focus is on developing the SIS investment portfolio, uh, where we'll be looking to make investments in, in clean energy uh, directly related to your priority around uh, uh, investment. Um, we've done a lot in terms of developing the structure of the portfolio um, our intent is to have a proposal to the board, if not by the end of this year, then early next year uh, for, for approval. However, in the, in the interim, we've been doing a lot of, of initial due diligence uh, around potential partners and vehicle structures. Um, and, and when we're doing this diligence, we're doing it in ways that look to align not only with 
the goals and objectives of the low carbon transition, but also with the collaborative model. And, and the goal is that once we do get the CIS private portfolio approved, we'll, we'll be able to move more quickly uh, uh, into uh, making an investment into that portfolio. I've also been working with other asset classes, seeing if there's ways we can leverage relationships that they have into investment opportunities. And I think in doing this, we've, we've helped to, to develop a better understanding around transition readiness in, in other asset classes. And next slide. So STIRS, uh, you know, we have a very long history of stewardship around climate change. Uh, this is continuing within the low carbon transition work plan. Um, as you can see here, we've been one of the most successful leads in the Climate Action 100 Plus, uh, securing five net zero commitments out of the uh, eight companies we're leading at, uh, looking at the low carbon policy advocacy initiative. Uh, you can see we're on a number of series led uh, initiatives, working groups, advisory committees focused on climate related policy initiatives, and certainly looking to continue that going forward. Um, concerning activist stewardship, a bit limited what I can say here. I think what I can say is we're valuing a potential opportunity to escalate engagement uh, with a company central to the low carbon transition effort. And this possible opportunity would combine our, our expertise in activism and stewardship. Next slide. And then communications, you know, as I said earlier, we believe it's extremely important that we effectively communicate what we're doing around this work plan. Uh, you know, we do publish the Green Initiative Task Force every year. You know, we publish the, the quarterly value of engagements. The Green Team Report has recently updated so that it's uh, Senate Bill 964 compliant and it's aligned with the TCFD disclosure recommendations. And we've included low carbon uh, information in the value of engagement. Uh, certainly these publications will continue going forward, but I think the questions, you know, asking ourselves is, is this enough? Can we do better? I think the answer is yes, we can do better. So this final work stream is really focused on, on developing and executing low carbon communication strategies. Uh, you know, so the low carbon team insists working with the strategic relations team insists, and also working with the CalSTRS communications team. Uh, next slide. So apologies, sort of threw a lot of information at you there pretty quickly. Um, these last two slides, we just maybe slow down a bit, catch our breath and, and, and talk to you or tell you about the priorities we have as a staff for fiscal year 2021. Uh, we want to make sure that, that what our priorities are aligned with what your priorities are. So as you can see here, one of our goals around transition readiness is certainly to complete the assessments in real estate and global equity and to start at least one other additional class, asset class transition ready assessment. Um, you know, now that we have uh, the, the low carbon index in the CIS portfolio, we want to get going considering alternatives to that index. Are there other products out there that better align with the, the, the goals and intent of the low carbon transition work plan? Uh, we want to continue to leverage uh, the relationship we have with the strategy and risk team, looking at platforms that assess total fund risk, you know, total fund low carbon transition risk. And certainly a big goal is to get the CIS private portfolio approved and to make at least one investment into that portfolio. Next slide. There's also a few other objectives that we have uh, as staff. Uh, certainly want to continue to seek out expertise, whether it's through data and analytics, through our peers, managers, climate change experts, academics, and use that expertise to better bolster our risk management efforts and our ability to take advantage of investment opportunities. Uh, secondly, we want to continue to be leaders in engagement and advocacy, particularly in our work with the Climate Action 100 Plus. Uh, and then, and thirdly, as I mentioned just before, develop and deliver enhanced communication strategies around what we're doing within this work plan. Um, again, so apologize for, for all the information maybe that was thrown at you. I think this reflects the importance that we place on climate change risk management, and that can be seen through all the resources we're putting into this low carbon economy work plan. Uh, certainly at this point, happy to answer any questions you have or hear any comments you have about you know, what we've done or what we intend to do going forward. So thank you. Great, thanks very much, Brian, and thanks, Kirsty. And um, Brian, no need to apologize for covering so much because it's. I think it's actually important for us to to um, remember um, and recognize all the things that we've done historically and all the really really good work that um, that your teams are working on right now going forward. So um, so it, it's impressive, and I think it's a it's a good reminder um, to kind of inventory a lot of those activities. Um, we do have a, a couple of questions. So I will turn um, turn it over first to the controller, Betty. 
Thank you, Joy, and thank you, Kirsty and Brian, for the great presentation. Uh, first of all, congratulations on really just um, <clears throat> You know, pulling all these pieces that seem pretty disparate oh, a little short while ago together into really a robust plan. And um, I also wanted to draw attention to the uh, new web page on the transition to the low carbon economy, where uh, I think it's a great tool to actually uh, talk about uh, <clears throat> how we're evaluating our portfolio, the engagements we're doing. Uh, the partnerships or even comments on fossil fuel divestment there and so uh, it's a great resource and i hope uh, we can uh, continue to build that out uh, as we uh, execute the plan um, i had a couple questions one is um, i just wanted to be sure i understood that in terms of the uh, work that uh, kirsty you and brian and the team are doing that this is really going to be um, I guess uh, synergistic, I guess, with uh, some of the other asset class staff, right? Because um, I, I would imagine that um, the information that you're going to be getting from your uh, risk profiles are going to be instructive to uh, decisions that, for example, the private asset staff may be making. Uh, you know, yes, definitely. Um, I think in, in the real estate case that, that I highlighted, uh, we've been working quite closely with, yeah. with staff there. I think we did an extremely thorough analysis of, of their portfolio. Again, you know, surveying, you know, what are climate experts saying? Uh, you know, what are peers doing? And we've, we've come up with a, uh, you know, identified a good service provider. And, and certainly uh, uh, that will be very beneficial to their portfolio once we're able to integrate that uh, platform. Okay. So let's say uh, with respect to kind of the risk profile, you identify maybe a type of property or some geographic location that may pose um, significantly high risk. Um, I guess, what's the expectation there? Is this just really to inform and, and uh, instruct rather than uh, really direct any kind of action in terms of selling off assets or anything like that? Well, I think it's difficult for me to say what actions the real estate group would take. Uh -huh. Certainly, I think it, it would, I would think it would aid them in making decisions in terms of whether that was a, a property or an asset that they wanted to hold. Um, I, I could see it be, certainly be beneficial and when they're considering new assets to do, you know, once they do this analysis and integrate that into their decision making. Uh -huh. Okay. Maybe I can um, make a quick comment, um, yeah. if I may. Yeah, I think this is, um, this is really interesting stuff because one, one of the things that we're finding, Betty, is that um, this type of risk not, is not necessarily priced into the market. Exactly. Right. And so we have a unique opportunity in shedding light on this. And understanding the physical risks um, and map it out to our, you know, our, uh, beginning with the real estate portfolio, but maybe our, our mortgage portfolio, et cetera. And I think it's going to eventually lead to decisions, um, hopefully decisions where if it's not priced in, we can find a better risk reward, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think it's going to shed a lot of light into what we do, but the optimism right now stems from the fact that I don't think it's completely priced in, which is unique. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's um, good. I'm looking forward to to uh, to those discussions. And then um, I know we've been doing a lot of partnering, a lot of um, collaboration work, and I wanted to just get a sense of whether there was an opportunity to work with other investors in terms of identifying, uh, for example, uh, best in class transition risk assessment tools or data providers, because um, obviously that's um, that's going to be driving you know a lot of the work that we need to do. Oh no! I, I think there's certainly opportunities to partner with with other investors and, and what we're doing around uh, you know transition uh, risk risk management. I think our analysis in looking at you know one of the things that we saw that there weren't at least particularly in the U.S. there weren't a lot of other uh, peers or partners doing doing a whole lot. We tend to be out front on this, so you know who partnering with other investors maybe maybe not. Obviously, the Europeans are doing a lot, so there might be some opportunity mm -hmm. there. Uh, but I think, you know, our thing initial analysis is a lot of this is really cutting edge and we're kind of first movers in a lot of this risk assessment uh, effort. Yeah, no, certainly in the United States for sure and probably in North America. Um, just curious as to whether yeah. uh, globally there might be some opportunities. So The Canadians okay. are doing some good things. So there might be some opportunities there, I think, if we if we dig a little deeper. Okay. I think okay. we just, sort of, Betty, just to add to that, if I may, I think uh -huh. it's, um, we are quite clear about what we want to do in this yeah. work. We don't know that other investors have other agendas as well. And a lot of what we're doing right now is who is aligned to thinking about this the way we do in terms of wanting to understand risk return profile first and foremost, and then the impact yeah. they have on the environment. And we have really strong connections in, in Australia, in parts of Europe, 
um, and as Brian said, in Canada as well. And so it's it's going and picking the right partner on each initiative, whether it be through stewardship that we mm-hmm. want to be aligned with is, is really helpful, but great. A lot of informal discussions as well with people that we trust just to sort of like thrash it out and say, how are you thinking about this? And so uh-huh. that's been the most helpful I find. Okay. Good, good. And then lastly, um, I didn't know whether CalSTRS was participating in the series uh, Climate Guidance for Investors Initiative. Um, is that something that we're doing? Um, we're certainly familiar with that. Um, in fact, uh, right now, one of our efforts is looking at ways that possibly we can support that. Okay. But right. not, we weren't really too involved in the development of it. Okay, right, right. All right. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to highlight the web page. It's a great resource and really great job by the team. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Betty. Great. Thank you, Betty, and thanks for um, for reminding us about the great resource on the website. Um, Sharon, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I, I was actually going to mention that as well because I think that's a really good tool. I, I really appreciated and listened um, intently to our public comment this morning, and I think it's, it's always a challenge to get up, you know, sort of if you're new to hearing about CalSTRS and how we're engaging or if you've been around for five or 10 years to kind of understand some of the history and the process. So I really appreciate staff putting that resource out there because it does, I think, kind of give some of the, the history about kind of where we've been, where we're going, and then obviously adding that new investment belief this last year. I think that that's um it, it continues to show the commitment we have not only in, in words, but also kind of with with our uh, with our asset allocation. So I, I really appreciate that resource. So Betty, thank you for highlighting that. And I just want to reiterate that that's a good tool. Um, Scott, can we just go back to kind of the conversation you were having? Because it, it was one of the questions I have is for our investment staff, kind of that whole issue around how do we think about how how is climate priced into the market, I guess, as we look at all these different asset classes and as we think about um, not only making a commitment, you know, through our investment beliefs, but also through through dollars. Um, how do we think about that right now? Like, how is climate kind of, you were kind of commenting that it's you don't think it is priced into the market at this point. So how is we as in- investors, how are we to think about that in terms of as we think about moving forward and where we want to shift um, our investment dollars. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I think we see it in, in really three different ways. The first way you're, you're familiar with the history is that we incorporate these considerations in every investment decision we make on a risk basis, right? The, the second is then understanding across our portfolio what opportunities there are. And every asset class is pursuing those opportunities. The, th- the third way for us is the development of CIS's portfolio. And we're breaking it up into two parts, the public portfolio, which we talked about in the last meeting, and then a, a new private portfolio, which we think can serve as a additional um, sort of spark plug, if you will, to, to source ideas across our partnerships. And I think what we're finding is that that there is some inefficiency here. There's, there's some inefficiency in terms of the sourcing and how people define sustainable investments. And what, what I'm um, realizing is that we've got a, a deep set of fantastic partners who are doing sustainable investments, but they don't have funds that are geared around it. They, they, they're doing sustainable investments right. you know, in, in their energy fund. They're doing their flagship fund. They got a credit fund that's doing it. And so we're going to our partners and um, we're leveraging them. So, you know, for example, in the private markets, we'll, we'll take our top 10 partners in the, these areas and we'll be able to jointly um, source with them, which I think is really exciting because there's some inefficiency to that sourcing from the very, from the very get-go. And we've talked about the other side, which, which we're trying to Avoid. I'm not saying every new fund is, is something to avoid, but we're seeing a lot of new funds around um, sustainability that don't necessarily make sense, but are looking to to market and, and sort of raise dollars. Um, but I think to your point, what we are finding is that there there are interesting opportunities, um, and and I like the idea of shopping in our own backyard. We have phenomenal partners that are that are doing this, and so why not pair up with them and 
Christy hasn't uh, mentioned this recently, but we're working on joint ventures in, in the real estate on things like affordable housing. We're, we're working with private equity to develop um, co-investment vehicles that, that span their entire fund structure for these types of investments. And so I think there's some really exciting things that are going on on those three levels, the risk analysis, the, the, the natural sourcing that goes across the portfolio, and then these specific portfolios. Um, one more point, if I may make, and this is, a, you know, sort of kudos to, to Brian and Kirsty and the team, that they found some, some uh, partners that are looking to incorporate this data uh, from a risk perspective, which then we can take a better look across our portfolio. And th th this is a, a newer concept and, and the data is, is new, but I think it's going to lead to um, a, a tremendous amount of more knowledge and information for us across the, the portfolio. And I, I, I'm in especially interested because it, it's, it's into the risk side of the equation. And so it, it can, it, I think eventually we can look across the whole portfolio from that perspective. Thanks, Scott. And then just, a, I guess, a political question, and it piggybacks on earlier conversations we've had, because the obviously there's been a lot of talk with the Department of Labor and just on, on the kind of the federal side around maybe minimizing the definition of fiduciary duty back down after all the work we've tried to do to expand that. And I just wanted Kirsty and team, obviously a lot will, will hinge on probably the election in November, but... Um, as, as we do this work, and I mean, I think framing it as as risk is really intelligent because I think that's the way to move the needle is is looking at it from that perspective. I think that's that's how we've developed. I think a lot of a momentum um, in the U.S. as a large asset owner. But do you do you see any challenges ahead if if things stay the way they are right now, current administration potentially, and the DOL um, in terms of the work that we can do in this area as an asset owner? I think, Sharon, you mean, you're absolutely right. They, there have been so many developments at the Department of Labor which have seek to undermine this as a risk area. And so we have to stick to what we've done for many, many years, which is we do this because we understand it within the realms within which we work as fiduciaries. And we're obviously sending comments left, right and center. The team is <laughs> really busy on the comments that it's sending to different groups right now and, and uh, on the undermining that we're seeing. But I think to your point, we see ourselves at a really interesting position because none of us obviously can predict what's going to happen in November, as Chris was just saying, but we could go between two such extremes in terms of what it means for climate policy, for what it means for fiduciary duty interpretations. And so again, we're just trying to make sure that we have all bases covered for each eventuality. We're also trying to understand, you know, if Biden wins the election, what does that mean for climate policies and incentives right. and everything else where the opportunities the time frame for those opportunities might compress if there is very supportive policy. So it's trying to be as nimble as we possibly can um, and also keep trying to read the policy signals that we're getting and have the experts that we have to help us position either way, but also make our voice really known that this is not a political issue. This, as we see it, ESG investing is a risk parameter and we're collaborating an awful lot with other investors. Huge message being sent, I think, to the DOL at the moment from global investors on just this is not the right way to tackle this. And that's a consensus view from investors. Great. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Um, we do have several more board members with questions. I've got Gail, Bill, and Harry. Um, before we turn to Gail, if, if I might, um, Harry, I just wanted to check in. Is there um, is your comment related to this section that we want to have you jump in now, or um, are you okay to proceed with Gail and Bill? I'll defer to Gail and Bill. Thank you, Joy. Okay, thank you. All right, um, thanks, Harry. So Gail, we'll turn to you, and then Bill, and then Harry. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. This is very helpful. I'm previewing a little bit that the Department of Finance, based on the governor's executive order, will be issuing a framework and just really grateful to Calsters and Kirsty, your team for, for helping and educating us. Two questions along those lines, one on the, the low carbon index funds and public equity to see if you've seen any, um, let me see if I can tell what slide that was. If you've seen any, it, I can't tell what slide, oh, slide six of 12. Um, if in terms of the public equity space, I know there've been some concerns that the low carbon index funds are actually actively managed because there's not 
a broad agreement on which which is a a low carbon index fund more like the S&P 500 as we see some folks falling off I imagine we're seeing more of a movement towards a passively managed index fund but could you comment on that please all right, I'll take this one and then you add, please, if you have anything to add to. Sure. Um, very much, I mean, again, as we know, with so many things and so many different um, products and strategies, it's all in the definition. I mean, as you know, at the moment, the low carbon index that we currently have is internally managed by our global equity team colleagues, tracks an MSCI um, index and has a very low tracking error. Um, there are a whole gradients of risk um, tolerances, I guess, in a low carbon index that one can dial up the tracking or dial it down depending on how active or enhanced and passive you want to manage it. There's a whole suite of products. I think what's interesting to us is um, data has evolved. We sort of mentioned this, I think, at the last board meeting. Data has evolved, strategies have evolved, have evolved abilities to both reduce carbon emissions, but also try and tap into some of the mispricing that we alluded to in the markets and certain public securities. We think there's actually some really interesting work and analysis to be done to survey the landscape and see where those most exciting opportunities must be. But then I think also it's incumbent on us, as we talked about with you in July, we're building, as you know, a sort of a very systematic approach to the CIS portfolio overall, both from the public side and the private side, with a risk budget that we want to discuss with you later this year, early next year, in terms of how that looks. So any changes that we might make to the low carbon index, which will both achieve the carbon reductions goals will have to also fit within the overall risk return parameters that we want to set for the portfolio and the risk budget within it. So we'll be looking at a couple of options there and then discussing and bringing that back. But very exciting areas, I think, for us to, to review here. Yeah, I, I would just add that the sort of research diligence we've done around you know, low carbon or you know, index-like products uh, as preliminary, I think what we're seeing is a lot of them are kind of similar to what we have now they tend to focus on emissions and a lot of emissions is bad and, and, and fewer emissions is good and you over underweight, you know, based on that. Um, I don't know if that's because of, you know, you know, the preference of investors to not too far, move too far away from traditional cap weighted indexes. You know, what, you know, at what point do you sort of break through that definition of what is, is passive and what becomes, you know, semi-active or enhanced or whatever. Um, but, you know, there, as, as Kirsty alluded to, there are a few, I think, interesting products out there that are a bit more thoughtful in how they approach index or index like management, you know, how are companies contributing to the low carbon transition, how might they not, and, and, and working to try to integrate that into, uh, you know, how they construct the index, you know, whether that, you know, gets it too far away from a passive, you know, product for some investors, I guess, remains to be seen. Right. I mean, I am just because so much of CalSTR is passively managed. I do think it's an interesting idea in terms of moving the market towards a more open sourced, agreed upon passive fund. I think that's going to be a really big step we can all take to make sure that more that it's easier and simpler to invest in these passive funds that have the returns. I think, you know, the question is, if we get ahead of some of the movements of folks coming off the S&P 500 and then those coming on, I think we're already seeing that movement. So I do think to the extent we can use our engagement to really to, to push that and see what we can do not only with um, MSCI and others, but also just sort of within within our global equity portfolio to see if we can move the needle on, on some of that. My second question around disclosure, you guys did a great job on the SB 964 report, and it, it'll be another piece that you'll see discussed um, when Department of Finance releases its plan. And Obviously, going into climate week, I think there'll be a lot of discussion around disclosure and, and what that means and, and who it applies to. I'm just curious in terms of our membership in SASB and TCFD, if part of your work plan, and certainly you don't need to answer this now, but will be more thoroughly explaining how you use those disclosure metrics in terms of the CIS portfolio and then eventually as as we get greater comfort across asset classes, perhaps how will, to build on the controller's question around physical risk and real estate, how we'll really begin to understand what we're seeing in those disclosures and, and how they'll actually be incorporated into decision-making. Um, you can answer that now or at another time as you continue to build on that report. No, happy to take it, Gail, because I think it's, you know, it's where our team sort of the activities overlap between the stewardship where we're pushing for the better disclosure 
um, through initiatives like the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD, and SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Um, we're pushing for better disclosures so that we can make better investment decisions made based on that disclosure. Um, I think we're extremely well represented at Casters to have, you know, through Jack sitting on the board of the Global Reporting Initiative, through Chris and I being heavily involved in SASB and also the TCFD, a window into influencing each of those bodies to continue it, continually iterate. And then for us to use that as with our fellow investors and in saying, our expectation companies is that this is the gold standard and the gold plated standard that we want you to report to. We have to have that if we're going to be able to sort of square it in terms of the investment decision making. So I think it's it's getting the disclosure good, encouraging getting this disclosure to be better, using it and then showing proof of case is still the trajectory that we need to go through. Um, and it's getting better, but we're still not there, you know, on many metrics. Um, but very much hear you. I appreciate that. And I think the work you're doing could really be a game changer for public funds writ large. I think um, I do think some of the European funds around Climate Week, I think that this is going to be a big push of the UN. I do think it'll be interesting to see how we can, as we start to execute that, really become a model for the rest of the country. Yeah. So I'm really grateful for that work and appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Gail. Um, Bill. Well, I, I, I must say that I'm always very proud to be uh, aligned with CalSTRS uh, because of the work that you, Brian and Kirsty, have continued to do and the work that has been done before you um, in this area because uh, you're a recognized leader uh, in this area. My question is, you know, it seems to me, you know, being relatively new to the, the party, that it's probably uh, easier to determine uh, physical risk. Uh, there are more sort of identifiable criteria that you can rely upon uh, than it is transition risk. And where I, I remember the the report at our our offsite last October uh, from Rhodium, which appeared to be you know going in that direction, trying to determine what kind of criteria would be used. Where, where is that development, uh, not only with Rhodium, but in the marketplace? Sure, Bill. Some of the response to this might be best to sort of discuss in closed session as well, um, okay. just because it's a very live discussion with them and some of their partners. But I'll just to say that it's, it's definitely happening. And I think the route for making um, accessible to investors in investable terms, some of the physical risk data is, is really acute right now and, and very exciting. So maybe I could leave that there, but I do definitely um, hear what you say in the difference between physical risk. Um, there are some ways to model that perhaps more easily than transition risk, um, where obviously the variables are so extreme. We just talked about what could happen with policies here in the US, depending on, on elections, which would be both the technology, you know, influence technologies and everything else. So I'll leave it there just to say, maybe we can come back to that and give you a little bit more detail later on. Yeah, I'm used to asking a question that can't be answered in open session. <laughs> anyway, I apologize, but I look forward to uh, the discussion in closed session. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Bill. Um, Harry, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Joy. Well, Brian, Kirsty, thanks for all the good work. It reinforces to me at least um, why we've taken the approach that we have. It really is a terrific overview of all the work that's been done the accomplishments to date and the roadmap going forward um, on a topic in which from my, in, at least in my view is there's a lot of noise, I think around this topic, a lot of misinformation, a lot of distractions um, from even well-intended people. I think data-driven decision-making is critically important um, and being relevant in a conversation as complex as this is critically important and to remain relevant will be very important to our success going forward. At the end of the day, for me, this is really about managing risks and maximizing opportunities for return to achieve our 7% return objective over the long haul. And being able to link all of these efforts back to that, I think is really important for us to be able to do. Um, having said that, I do have a question on INV 222. Um, still learning myself so much about this topic. Could, could you speak a little bit about the role that agriculture plays 
on, on uh, the admission of uh, carbon into the atmosphere and its role? Seems to be a pretty big slice of the pie. Sure, Harry. It's, um, I'll start, Brian, again, fill yeah. in it's multiple areas, really. Um, there is both um, actual methane emissions from livestock themselves. Um, there is the uh, deforestation that happens in order to for land use, in order to grow more food for people. Um, there are also the um, treatment fertilizer runoffs into water as a result of, of, of kind of like contamination as well. So the climate impacts related to agriculture are pretty extreme. They overlap a lot into sort of water scarcity and water risk, which is obviously drought led as well. So it's so very multidimensional. And I do think that it's a really interesting area. A lot of the focus, obviously, that we hear about and, and, and certainly in, in these meetings is on energy. I think the agricultural part of the equation in terms of plant-based proteins, the need to think about deforestation, how you're sourcing different commodities, food commodities is, is a really important piece. And where some of the most interesting innovations are thinking are happening in opportunities as well to invest in some of the solutions. So this is definitely an area as we look towards the CIS portfolio building that out going forward that we'd identified as a sector that we need to sort of have deeper insights into to see where the opportunities might be for some of the solutions to these challenges. Can add on to that, Harry Chris Salmon. Um, you've got to realize while there's a lot of focus on carbon, particularly for um, transportation, and we get a lot of comments about transportation, it's the fact that you still have uh, millions of people, particularly in India and in sub Saharan Africa, that don't have electricity. So the electricity demand is going to grow exponentially. And unfortunately, their first choice to generate electricity is carbon. And then food scarcity, where it's well known that, that uh, we do not have adequate food for the planet. Um, the median age, I believe the statistic is that Sub-Saharan Africa is going to have uh, a median age around 16 and, and certainly a very young population. Um, how we provide that food and the tools, it could lead to massive deforestation, which would be an enormous carbon problem but also the supplies, because it can't, as we've discussed, it, it takes a, a huge amount of water and a huge amount of uh, carbon to produce a pound of pork, a pound of chicken, a pound of, of beef. So how we feed the population, those issues are as big, and as you can see in that pie chart, bigger than transportation. So it is a, a holistic discussion uh, and we're trying to attack it on all those points. And, and one last thing I, I would like the board to think about, we're gonna come back to you with a discussion about creating a private segment to the sustainability portfolio in private markets. But we also talked about a final step of looking at indices and other areas that we may want to be active and tilt the portfolio. So uh, we wanna get your feedback um, as we think about coming back to you in the November meeting and maybe a little bit of the January meeting um, to, to wrap up this project on low carbon. Not to wrap it up and finish it, but to wrap it up as far as the investment committee study. We'll be working on this for a generation. Thanks. Joy, I do have one, one other question. Okay, go ahead, Harry. Thank you, Joy. Um, so Brian, if you could just um, um, refer me back to the, the power of engagement. I think the, the report mentions eight uh, engagements that we've had either uh, where we took the lead with Climate Action 100. I think it was five out of the eight companies made commitments to a net zero. Could you, can you reference that for me again, just so sure. uh, for the point of emphasis on the, the power of engagement and results that are possible? Sure. So, so to, uh, we uh, are leading today companies, four of them in the, in the U.S., four in Japan. Uh, of the four U.S. companies, three are, are utilities, uh, Duke, Southern, and Dominion, and we have gotten net zero commitments from all three of those companies. Uh, the fourth company is, is Phillips 66, oil and gas refining. Um, while they have made some progress towards emissions reductions, uh, they have yet to make a firm commitment in terms of net zero, so that's one of the ones we're working on. Uh, the Japanese companies, um, Daikin and Enos, uh, both made net zero emissions commitments uh, by 2050. In fact, Enos did by 2040. 
Uh, that's an AC manufacturer and an oil and gas refiner. And then the other two companies, Nippon Steel and Torrey Industries, while they have made emissions reductions targets, about 30% reduction, they haven't made net zero commitments. So again, we'll be focusing on, on those. You know, Nippon Steel is a steel manufacturer. It's a bit difficult. You know, the energy intensity you need for that, uh, it's, it's hard to do that without fossil fuels. They are talking about a hydrogen-based solution. They do seem very interested in, in, in being able to make such a commitment, but right now, not. they don't think they're in a position to do so. And Tory Industries, that's probably the one where, I don't know if it's, it's just the language, cultural problems, but they seem to be most interested in getting out of the engagement than perhaps working with us, but we'll continue to press them. Thank you. Thanks for those efforts. Thanks, thanks for the uh, clarification. Thanks, Brian. Yep. Thank you, Joy. Okay, thank you, Harry. Um, uh, Chris, I just want to make sure, I think this is just an, this is an information item, so no specific action at this time. Um, but I, you know, I think um, the, you know, the next steps, Brian summarized on the slides, and they are summarized on INV 223 in terms of what um, Kirsty, Brian, and team will be working on. And I think you heard, um, you know, a lot of interest and support uh, from the committee for continuing the good work here. And what we'll just do is continue to make sure that we get updates, both, um, Chris, to your point, as we sort of wrap up some of these specific action items coming out of the work plan, but then maybe also thinking about how we continue to um, have both the public and the committee stay abreast of the, the work that we're doing. Because um, even, even when the specific work plan ends, um, you know, there, there's a lot of great activity that's going to continue. Um, so I know that we have um, some members of the public that have some comment on this particular item. Um, so for this specific item, agenda item number 10, um, we have 10 minutes for public comment. Um, and I will, um, I think we have at least two or three speakers, but I will turn it over to, um, to Samantha to help us manage that. Okay, um, our first comment will be from Paula. Paula, go ahead. I'm commenting on item seven. As a retired teacher and CalSTRS member, I'm really glad the low carbon work plan is on this month's agenda. With education groups throughout the state representing over 120,000 teachers calling for CalSTRS to divest from fossil fuels, no one can doubt that this issue is an important one. In Belief 9 and the Transition Readiness Assessment, CalSTRS acknowledges that climate change poses significant risks, and we have once again seen these risks firsthand in the devastating effects of the wildfires here at home and in the destruction to the Gulf Coast from Hurricane Laura, and the fire and hurricane seasons are not over yet. I appreciate CalSTRS' interest in renewable and low-carbon solutions, yet there are several areas where CalSTRS falls short in its response to the climate crisis most noticeably with the policy of engagement. And by the way, if we have zero carbon by 2050, that's going to be too late to avoid an irreparable climate catastrophe. While CalSTRS has tried to in exert influence through engagement, these same companies have increased fossil fuel production even as their value has plummeted. As you know, ExxonMobil was recently dropped from the Dow Jones. Engagement with Exxon is a dismal failure. The company continues to recklessly pollute as it loses its shareholders' money. Christy and Brian, I've been looking at the new webpage and I appreciate how clearly it prevent, presents info. But Kelsters tells your members that divestment from fossil fuels won't work and you ask us to trust you while you persist in this doomed engagement strategy. Is this an example of your low carbon transition education? Chris Aylman and board members, we've been told that putting fossil fuel divestment on the finance committee's agenda is out of the question. The way I see it, your fiduciary responsibility requires you to consider it. CalSTRS divestment policy states that the presence of one or more risk factors and loss of member confidence are reasonable grounds, with fossil fuel investments losing billions as they create environmental, health, and climate change risks, and so many members voting for a divestment. The time is right to put a discussion of fossil fuel and divestment on the agenda for your next meeting. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next person for comment will be Diana. Diana, go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Diana Curiel, and I'm a retired CalSTRS member. 
Thank you for the interesting conversation. I'd like to speak to risks inherent in the low carbon transition. On July 15th, as part of CalSTRS low carbon transition education, Ethan Zindler of Bloomberg New Energy Finance spoke on the future of energy. Our state controller, Betty Yi, asked him this interesting and incisive question. How do you factor in the concept of stranded assets into your forecast? Assets are stranded when they lose value. What is related to Ms. Yee's question is this. Are CalSTRS fossil fuel investments at risk of losing value when assets become stranded? Ethan Zindler explained two economic tipping points that could strand fossil fuel assets. The first tipping point has already passed. The price of renewables has undercut the price of existing fossil fuel generation. Mr. Zindler predicted that the second tipping point, where assets such as coal plants start being taken offline in some countries, might occur in about 10 years. A 2017 report from Lloyd, the British insurance giant, points to non-economic factors that may cause assets to be stranded. This report, called Stranded Assets, the Transition to a Low Carbon Economy, points to social, political, and legal factors which may affect the value of a variety of assets. The report states, changes to the physical environment driven by climate change and society's response to these changes could potentially strand entire regions and global industries within a short time frame. The CalSTRS 2018-2019 Sustainability Report outlines a plan to fully fund CalSTRS unfunded pension obligations by 2046. This date is well beyond the time frame when CalSTRS current fossil fuel investments may have become stranded. The report states, the largest risk facing CalSTRS ability to reach full funding is risk from investment volatility. CalSTRS, the time to divest from fossil fuels is now. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller will be Miriam. Miriam, go ahead. CalSTRS board, I was happy to see your public comment concerning ESG investments. I'm reservedly hopeful seeing your agenda today, including the low carbon transition but it was a bit concerning to me to hear that you're leading in climate responsibility in the United States, as your actions so far will be extremely insufficient to avoid the climate catastrophes hinted at by the fires surrounding us. It's not too late to take a serious look at your investments in fossil fuels, but at the moment you're receiving failing grades in fossil fuel investments, coal investments, and even fossil fuel engagement. You're closely tied to fossil fuel companies even. Do you worry about impartiality? I would draw attention to the CalSTRS report card recently published by Fossil Fuel California. It highlights that while you have followed the letter of the law with coal, there remain billions invested in companies that have diversified interests that include coal. Most importantly, however, the report card highlights that your Green Initiative Task Force report that you're basing your discussion from today does not reflect the Paris Climate Agreement goals. You've ignored hundreds of renowned scientists backing up data-driven risk assessments in the 2018 IPCC report that recommends that 1.5 degrees Celsius is the absolute limit for a recognizable future. Instead, you picked a 4 degrees Celsius scenario, which doubles the limit at which climate change would be considered catastrophic. In listening to your meeting, I have appreciated the variety of experts that you consult for your investment decisions. I might recommend that a climate change expert might support in developing a realistic low carbon investment plan that operates off of a stronger understanding of climate change. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. That concludes the public comment for item seven. Thank you, Samantha. And um, thank you to um, the three members of the public who, who offered um, the thoughtful comments to us. We appreciate them. Okay. Um, Moving to the next agenda item, uh, agenda item number eight is a review of information requests. Um. Um, Madam Chair, I just picked up one, um, which was on item 5A, and it was a request uh, that the committee begin to receive periodic updates um, with respect to the staff's implementation of the risk budgeting process. Great. That, that was the only one that I had also. So thank you, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Um, agenda item number nine is our draft agenda for the next committee meeting. Um, Chris, any comments that you um, want to offer on the agenda? 
Uh, no, at this point, uh, we may mix up some of the policies um, and push them off to November or to the following meeting. But no, it looks like it's very solid at this point. Um, and I think, Chris, the only comment I'd make is I know we had a placeholder on the agenda, I think, for um, an investment insight speaker. Um, I don't think we've firmly identified that. But um, maybe what we can do is touch base, because I know that since we're still meeting in a Zoom format, um, Harry and Sharon have given some thought to how to manage speakers at the committee meetings. So we'll we'll figure that out. Okay. okay. Sounds Great. good. Okay. Um, are there any other um, any other requests for public comment, Samantha? No request for public comment. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, that concludes um, our open session items. Um, we um, let's see. It's about two o'clock. Um, if the committee is okay with it, um, I'd like to take maybe a 10-minute break. We'll reconvene for closed session at 2.10. Um, and just as a reminder, everybody should exit this Zoom, and there's a separate Zoom link for the closed session since that will be restricted access. So we'll be back on um, at 2.10, uh, a little over 10 minutes, um, for agenda item number 10. Okay. Thanks, everyone.